from my uncle, the one up in San Francisco. Yeah. Aren't you gonna open yours? No, I know what it says. You do, huh? Yeah. Wish I hadn't opened this one. Old Uncle Fred wants another five. Five dollars? Well, yes, Joe. What'd you think, 500? I just sent him five dollars. When? Six months ago for his birthday. I can't understand that. Now, what do you suppose a man wants with another five this soon? Why don't you open yours? No, it's an invitation to a party. What kind of party? Alumni association. High school? No, that night school I used to go to. I didn't know night schools had alumni associations. Yeah, well, this one does. Want me to open it for you? Doesn't make any difference. I know what it says. Well, you never can tell about these things, Joe. Might be a refund on your tuition. After 10 years? No, no refund. Dear selected member, you are cordially invited to an informal gathering of men only Thursday evening, February 6th at 8 o'clock at my home, 4458 Edgewood Avenue. Signed, Paul Reed, Alumni Association President. Well, you gotta go, Joe. You're invited. Worse than that, I got trapped. The guy that signed that letter, Paul Reed, he called me at home last night. They must want you awful bad. No, they don't want me awful bad. They just want to have a good turnout, that's all. There won't be anybody there I know. You've always been a bear for higher education, haven't you, Joe? I try. Well, you've got time for all that. You're a single man. You went to regular college, too, didn't you, in the daytime? Yeah, but that was a long time ago. How long did you go? Not so you'd notice it. About eight months. How long did you go to this night school? Three and a half years. Well, you finally convinced me. Of what? You'll do anything to keep from getting married, won't you? Thursday, February 6th. Paul Reed was a real estate broker with political ambitions. Since leaving night school, we'd met socially one or two times and then purely by accident. Well, this calls for a celebration. Joe Friday at an alumni meeting. Might as well be the campfire girls. I don't know a soul. <laughs> we'll fix that, Joe. You will, huh? Tell me something. You ever hear of the Fielder Militia? Yeah, Paul, I've heard of him. Well, I'm thinking about joining up next meeting. Got the word a few days ago from Frank Baker. I'll introduce you to him. We could use you, Joe. That the reason for this special invitation? Right. What do you think of the outfit, politically, I mean? They're about as well-intentioned as a gun in the ribs. Fielder militia? You must be thinking of some other group. I've read their charter. Reminds me of one that was written in a jail cell about 45 years ago. What? Yeah, a place called Landsberg. The guy that wrote it used to hang wallpaper. Oh, come on now, Joe. I'm serious. Why, the police department hasn't got better friends anywhere than the fielders. That's the sole reason for their existence, to support law and order. I'm familiar with the claim. Well, you ought to be grateful, man. You and every other underpaid cop in the country. Support, isn't that what it's all about? Yeah, support, Paul, but not all kinds. Now, let me get this straight. You're the guy who has to go out on the streets and do the job. And you're telling me the department doesn't welcome all the help it can get? Paul, I can't speak for the department, but I'll say this. We want help. We welcome help. We're getting help from legitimate groups and responsible citizens. Now, that doesn't include people who yell spy every time they hear an accent or who look under the bed at night for a seditionist. It doesn't include racist, white or black, and it lets out people who think lawful protest is unconstitutional or the change is treason. It excludes nuts on either fringe, Paul. The guy who sees an anarchist and every kid with long hair. It excludes the fielder militia. Patriotism? Why, that militia of yours has got a corner on the market. Civil rights? They got them all. Protesters? Shoot them all down. Now, that may be your philosophy, Paul, but it's not mine. And I don't think it's the department's either. We work it a little different in this country. What do you mean? I wear a badge, Paul, not a swastika. Hey, what's going on here? I'm not sure, Frank. Joe Friday, right? That's right. Frank Baker. How are you? I overheard your little speech. What do you think, Paul? Lost cause? Afraid so. Oh, well, maybe not. I didn't catch his breath. Frank Baker, like most members of the militant fielder militia, was an outspoken proponent of law and order. He was also a gun fancier. By 11 p.m., the conversation had gotten around to his favorite subject. Well, tell me, Joe, what kind of handgun do you like? And don't tell me it's that blunderbush you hang on your belt. I managed to qualify with it. I'm talking about a fine weapon, something you'd be proud to own. How about a new putter? Oh, come on, Joe, play the game. All right, the 9mm Browning. How's that strike you? Best handgun ever made. Glad we found something to agree on. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you a question, Joe, off the record. Be sure you want to, Frank. I know. You're a policeman. I respect that, but... How would you like to own a Parabellum sub? You're talking about a submachine gun. That's right. I bet you never heard of it. No, but you'll tell me. Brand new weapons, dependable, rapid rate of fire, minimum rise. Feds missed 500 of them when they knocked over Mendino. Well, who's Mendino? Big runner back in Kansas. You'd like to own one of those guns? Well, now, what would I do with it? Right price, Joe. Why me, Baker? You could peddle all 500 of those guns overseas in the next 24 hours. That's right. 
If I had the license. The federal firearms license. Starting to seep through, huh? Yeah, well, it takes time. That's what I haven't got, Joe, time. I need that license, and I need it quick. There's a lot of dough at stake, believe me. Is that so? Enough for a lot of underpaid people. What do you got in mind? You've been on the job a long time, Joe. You've rubbed elbows with the guys in the Treasury Department. Go on. That's where the license has come from, Joe, and I need one. Bad. You want me to walk that license through, is that it? A word or two in the right place for a citizen who supports law and order. That's all I'm asking. You don't hear very well, do you, Frank? Perfectly. A while ago, I heard an overworked, underpaid cop trying to sell himself a bill of goods. You're sure of that, are you? I don't hear you reading me my rights. Friday, 8.30 a.m. I pulled the intelligence package on Frank Baker. Skipper set up a meeting with the Treasury Department ten minutes. Right. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, Baker did big time for ADW. He's a felon, that's why he's pushing me. He'll never get that license. But he thinks you can swing it for him. Yeah, and I gotta keep him thinking that. Intelligence memo from the Treasury Department. A year ago, Baker tried to make a connection with a tool company to fabricate trigger housings for machine guns. Never quits trying, does he? No. He really wants that federal firearms license, doesn't he? So bad he can taste it. There's only one thing bothers me. Yeah, where's he got the gun stashed? 8.40 a.m., Bill and I met with Captain Pierce Brooks and Area Supervisor Jack Courtney from the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Division of the United States Treasury Department. We had worked with Courtney before. All right. So Baker wants the federal firearms license so he can peddle automatic weapons. And we know about his record, but I'm just curious, Jack, has he applied for the license? Yes, and his application uses the address of the field of militia. Now that, and the fact that he's been convicted of a felony, would be grounds to deny the license. How's that, Jack? Under the old law, you could have a license at your home and operate from your broom closet but not anymore. The new gun act stipulates that you must have a bona fide place of business and be open to the public. Well, wouldn't the home office of the Fielder Militia qualify as a place of business? You know better than that, Joe. Fielder Militia isn't open to the general public and its headquarters are in Fielder's home. Has Fielder himself ever applied for a federal firearms license? No, he hasn't. And it looks like this time he's holding Baker's coat. Now, we know Fielder is supplying machine guns, grenades, bombs, you name it, to paramilitary groups all over the country. What we don't know is where he's warehousing them. We suspect it's someplace in your California desert, but it's a big desert. What about that 9 millimeter parabellum Baker offered me? He'll withdraw the offer. We put Mendino out of business 18 days ago. We seized 500 9 millimeter parabellum submachine guns. Well, what about the other 500? What are the 500? Those were it, the whole enchilada. But don't let it worry you, Joe. Fielder will service him. He'll have a substitute item. Where does Fielder get them? He steals them. From who? Biggest user we've got, the armed forces. Those big desert maneuvers a while back. You got it. We worked part of that case. Bunch of guys decided Uncle Sam had more ordnance than he needed. They got away with weapons, ammunition, any kind of equipment they could lay their hands on. The military nailed the thieves, we tagged some local buyers. You took over from there. Right. Some of that stuff we still haven't turned. We think it may be hidden in that piece of desert I mentioned. Okay, Joe, you know what to do. And play this one cool. Do that. If my guess is any good, he'll hand you a piece of that military ordinance. Yes, sir. Gift wrapped. 5 p.m., I called Frank Baker at his home in Sherman Oaks. He invited me over for a drink. Here you go, Joe. That's not heavy enough, you holler. Plenty, thanks. Ever seen anything like it? Yeah, once. Oh, where? England, the Imperial War Museum. That must be quite a place, I've never seen it. You know, they say you can tell a lot about a man by looking at the place he lives in, you believe that? Sometimes. Only one other thing I want to hang on these walls. A federal firearms license. That's right, you gonna help me? You're about as tactful as some of your hardware. Time, Joe. I don't have time. You're pressing, Frank, and that's a sign of ego. I'm not sure I like it. I sized you up in five minutes as a bright cop. Real flattering. You call it ego, I call it ability. The ability to make a decision. How about the license? I made a phone call today. Good for you. The investigation on you has just started. It could take a long time. How's that word again? The agent in charge is a friend of mine. Glad to hear it. Where do you plan to store the hardware? What hardware? The guns you plan to buy and sell, or is the license just to hang on your wall? Oh, here, maybe, out on the desert. Why? Your application doesn't say here. I read it. I figured you would. I also read your LAPD package. I also figured you would. All right, why didn't you figure to tell me that you did time for ADW? Now, you know the Treasury Department won't issue a gun license of any kind to an ex-con. That's going to make it pretty rough to push that license through. Yeah, but you know something, Joe? What's that? You're just a man that can do it. Saturday, February 8th, I met with Treasury Agent Jack Courtney. If this thing goes down right, Joe, that guy Baker can lead us to Fielder. Then Fielder's one guy we'd like to clap a lid on. He's always where the action is, here and abroad. He operates like an underground river. We keep sinking wells and we can't hit water. We still don't have one piece of concrete evidence that ties him to those illegal weapons. 
Did Baker drop anything about the location of that warehouse? No, sir. When I asked him where he stored the hardware, he said here or out in the desert. Pinpointed, Joe, as fast as you can, hmm? Monday, February 10th, 4.15 p.m. You're a bright boy, Joe, but you took a little too long to make up your mind. Parabellums are off the market. We're sold out. But I'll fix you up with something that'll make you just as tall. What do you got in mind? Old military classic, the Thompson. It's a lot of firepower. The way things are on the street today, and your job, it's a working man's best friend. You're gonna deliver on this one. Seventy bucks to you. You got any more at that price? This is for your personal use, Joe. If things work out, we'll take care of your friends later. All right, tomorrow's my day off. How about you and me taking a run out the desert? Not unless you want to shoot jackrabbits. Huh? You pick it up right here. <laughs> February 10th, 5.30 p.m. Baker told you you could pick up that submachine gun in 48 hours, is that it? Yes, sir, that's it. We've got the Baker house and the field of militia headquarters staked out, but I doubt if it'll do any good. He's too smart to send a runner in with that weapon. And you're still no closer to the stash than you were before, hmm? No, sir, that's right. Well, what worries me is he'll deliver that Thompson to you, all right, but if he still hasn't told you where that military hardware is stored, one thing's sure, we've reached another dead end. Let's talk about the buy. Where do you live, Joe? I've got an apartment in the Silver Lake District. It's no Taj Mahal. How many rooms? Living room, bedroom. Sounds fine. Think you can get Baker to turn the gun over to you there? Well, that's a tall order. Yes, I know. But we want to be there to corroborate, and I'd like to see this one prosecuted federal. Any ideas how you're going to get Baker up to your apartment? Just one. What's that? Ask him. Tuesday, February 11th, 9.30 a.m. I put in a call to Frank Baker and told him it was important that I talk to him. I suggested we meet at my apartment. At the outset, he was reluctant, but he finally agreed. We set the time for 8.30 that night. Tuesday, February 11th, 8.30 p.m. Frank Baker was prompt. You live in a nice neighborhood. Yeah, it's out of the high rent district. It's all your stuff or it come with a lease. Now, you're not a furniture lover, Frank. You're looking for company and I haven't got any. Well, it's not that I don't trust you, Joe. It's just that I'm a businessman. I play it up close. Well, Joe, what's on your mind? It's your party. You're talking about the collector's item. You're 20 hours early. I didn't figure you'd have it in your pocket, Frank, but that's what I want to talk about. Talk? Two things about our arrangement, both of them bad for you and for me. Now, number one, I don't think it's a good idea for me to be waltzing in and out of your place. I'm known in this town. You never know who might spot me. Number two, maybe it's just my imagination, but my boss has been talking sideways to me. Your boss? The captain. Well, like how? Like nothing definite. It's just the assignments he's been putting me on. Looks like he's been keeping me away from the big stuff. What do you mean? Well, he slid me onto the back shelf as far as important investigations are concerned. And I've seen this happen before to guys who try to go into business for themselves. The first thing that happens when the department gets hinky about an officer is they keep him off key assignments. Then they let him run until he braids a long enough rope, then they hang him. Now, you slice it down any way you like, Frank, but when you tote it up, it comes out the best way for you and me both. What best way? That we do business here instead of your place. You got anything to drink? Some scotch. That'll do, but don't spoil it. You know something, Joe? What's that? I get a funny feeling about you. Is that right? I hope I'm right. Thanks. You lived here long? Six, seven years. Nice place. You do your own housekeeping? Well, I got a woman comes in once a week. All nice and tidy. True blue civil service. Joe, I think I got you paid. You have. Maybe just a little. But it's starting to show around the edges. You're beginning to believe, am I right? Maybe. Maybe he's good enough. Joe, you know how many members we got in the field of militia? Four or five hundred. Closer to a thousand five hundred in this state alone. And I'm talking about dues-paying members, Joe, not sympathizers. And every one of those fifteen hundred started out with maybe. You're on the right track, friend. Let me build that up a little for you. No, no thanks. I fly better on one wing. I tell you what, Joe, I believe everything you said. I don't think it's too good an idea for you to be seen at my place. And I'm just as concerned about your captain as you are. Don't let it worry. I still got it under control. Oh, I know you have, or I wouldn't be here. And I'll tell you something else. The day's gonna come when I deliver a Sherman tank to you at Hollywood and Vine. That'd never fit in the front seat of my car. Oh, by then, you'll have friends. Thanks for the drink. Then we do business here. Oh, not a chance. I see. You live in a nice neighborhood, Joe, but you're a long way from Hollywood and Vine. Wednesday, February 12th, 8.35 a.m. I filled in the captain and treasury agent, Jack Courtney, on my meeting with Frank Baker the previous night. It was agreed that I should follow through and try to make the buy of the Thompson submachine gun on Baker's terms. There was still an outside chance that he might reveal the location of the hidden military equipment. Bill and I left the PAB and drove across town to Frank Baker's residence. I dropped Bill off two blocks away to connect up with the Treasury Department's stakeout teams. It was 4.30 p.m. 
If Baker intended to make good on the sale of the Thompson submachine gun, it was time. The 48 hours were up. You're as prompt as I am, Joe. How'd you know I had the merchandise? You said 48 hours. Like a drink? No, thanks. Like see what you're buying? That's why I'm here. This is a personal selection, Joe. Detailed strip, cleaned oil, test fired 100 rounds. It's A number one. I know I did it myself. Where'd you do all this? The warehouse. Live a little, Joe. The Thompson submachine gun, caliber 45, M1A1. An air-cooled, straight, blowback, action magazine-fed weapon. Weight, 10 pounds, 13 ounces. Number of groove, six. Sights, front, fixed blade, rear, fixed aperture. Muzzle velocity, 920 feet per second. Effective range, 200 yards. Maximum range, 1,600 yards. Feed system, 20 and 30 shot staggered column detachable box magazine. You want me to wrap it up, or will you eat it here? How many magazines? Two 20s. You won't have any use for a 50 unless you plan to start a war. What about a sling? I'll get you one if you think you need it. Tell me the truth. You ever see a prettier piece of machinery? It's a fine one. I bet you never figured your 70 bucks would buy you that much fun, did you? I brought the cash. Oh, I'll take it easy. There's no rush. How about that drink? You got something to celebrate now, haven't you? I guess I have. Oh, Joe, this is no schlock operation. When I tell you we got the goods, we got them in all first class. I'm convinced. Let's see, you need a couple of boxes of ammo? I could use them. No sweat. Well, Joe, here's to your new playmate of the month. In other words, you're telling me that all your hardware is in mint condition, like that piece I'm buying. No, I didn't say that, Joe. But most of it's so good, you got to see it to believe it. I'd like to. I got a call in right now. Everything works out. You and I are going to take a little Sunday afternoon run. Oh, where to? A nice dry place where the climate's good for powder and steel. You mean the place on the desert? Excuse me a minute. Baker here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir, not yet. I understand, sir. Welcome. You know, it'll be easier if I break that down to travel with it. This piece isn't going anywhere. The deal's off. What do you mean? Just what I said. No deal. You know your way out. Wednesday, February 12th, 6.20 p.m. I picked Bill up from his stakeout position, and since my apartment was on the way back to the office, we stopped off to telephone the captain and fill him in. He said he'd notify the Treasury agents. Well, it's too bad. No, it's worse than that. If that lousy phone call hadn't come when it did, we'd have had the whole piece on a plate. Who do you figure was on the other end of that call? It's hard to tell. Obviously, somebody pretty high up in the militia. Could have even been Fielder himself. Who knows? If the Treasury people move in on Baker now, at least there's one machine gun out of circulation. Yeah, and how many more they got stacked up in that warehouse? Yeah. Well, I'll run the unit on in. Check us out. Right, thanks. See you tomorrow. Yeah, if I don't reach for the cyanide. Hello, Frank. Joe. Joe, you may live in a nice place, but these halls are a little drafty. Aren't you going to ask me in? Well, sure. It's just that I didn't expect you. <laughs> you got company? I thought I heard voices. No. Just had the radio on. There's no one here. Come on in. Bet you never expected to see me, huh? I just said that, Frank. So you did, chum. But I'm here, and you're seeing me. I uh, got a little something to drink, Joe. Whatever's left of that bottle of scotch. Keep it neat. Pour it tall. You know, you don't live far from me. It's funny, I never thought about it before, but you don't. You got any vacancies here? I just might move in. That's so, Joe. Now, you, uh, you just sip along with me and listen. I got something to tell you. Go ahead, Frank. I'm listening. Well, what do you think happened to me today? The worst thing in my life. They threatened to kick me out of the militia. Clean out. Is that right? No, it's not right, but they did it anyway. Who did it? Top dog, Commander Kenneth J. Fielder himself. That's who was on the phone when you were at my place. Why? Why what? Why'd they threaten to kick you out, Frank? Well, they might as well have kicked me out. They demoted me. I never told you this, Joe, but I was the adjutant commander. Four stars down from the commander himself. Adjutant commander, Joe, of the three western states. California, Nevada, and Utah. Sorry to hear that, Frank. Why'd they do it? You can call me Staff Sergeant Baker from now on. You know what that's like in the militia? I'm a company clerk, that's all I am. And just because you and me are friends. You're helping with that Treasury gun license and me trying to return the favor by selling you the Thompson. But Commander Fielder, he just can't see it that way. And you know something, Joe? What's that? I just missed getting a summary courts martial by that much. Now, you, uh, you got a little more there for a friend? Why are you telling me all this, Frank? Well, after you left today, I got to thinking. Maybe I'll do just like you're doing. Maybe I'll just go into business for myself. Oh, I'll keep up my dues in the militia, but 
You and me, we were building something toward the future, weren't we? Maybe, but so far it's been a little one-sided, hasn't it, Frank? I give you a shove down the road with the feds, but I haven't collected on my side of the favor yet. Oh, yes, you have. Caliber 45, M1A1. Same one you saw at my place this afternoon. All right. Uh, go easy on yourself. Half now, half on payday. You know? No, I can handle it. I got it all. We're still in business, aren't we? All right, Frank. We are, but what about the competition? What competition? Well, you and I can split a Thompson between us. They've got a warehouse full, haven't they? Yeah, they do, and I got a backyard full. Three feet down, wall to wall. Grenades, detonators, underwater demolition devices, the works. My backyard's a king-size sample case. A little bit of everything that got buried over in Arizona. Arizona? Yeah, they got a lot of desert down there, Joe. California doesn't have a corner on it. You ought to see that place. A cement block walls, three feet thick. I helped set them myself, 40 feet down. Now, you remember when I first met you, you mentioned something about the Imperial War Museum? But Joe, you ought to see this place. You name it, we got it. Mortars, 70 millimeter, recoilless rifles, bazookas, anti-tank guns. We even got 10 500-pound bombs in that place. That's a warehouse and a half, Joe. Whereabouts in Arizona? You take Highway 12, you go 19 miles to Carstair, turn left for eight miles of a raw sand, and there are three red granite bluffs a quarter of a mile away. Sight in on those dead center, and you come to an old adobe ranch house, or what's left of it. East wall, you step off exactly 40 paces east. Dig down four feet, and there's a metal trap door. Is that where this came from? No, that's part of my backyard inventory. And that's it, huh? That's the whole ball of wax. Frank, you're under arrest. Who are they? Agent Courtney, United States Treasury, and my partner, Gannon. Uh huh. You'll never make it stick, Joe. Militia's got good lawyers. Oh, it'll stick, Frank. Look at it this way. We're not the only group that believes in a strong America. There are plenty of others all over the country, and they're getting bigger every day. I really don't understand you people. Treasury agents, local police. You ought to understand what we're trying to do. We do. That's why we're closing you down. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 19th, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was found guilty on both federal and local charges relating to illegal sale and storage of explosives, illegal possession and sale of automatic weapons, and possession of stolen government property. We're flooding the area. Uppers are amphetamine sulfate tablets, a dangerous personality-destroying drug. It was up to us to choke off the flow. We'd been searching for a lead for weeks. It was beginning to look hopeless. I'd like you to hear it. He's charged with possession, amphetamine. He's been given his rights. Don't make it sound so big. This is the first time I've been busted. Yeah, but not the first time you've ever flown with co-pilots. Huh? So what? Everybody does it these no, days. No, Howie, not everybody. Meaning you? Meaning most of your generation. Yeah, sure, the squares. Maybe they're the smart ones. Think about that. Well, do it sometime. Do it now. Possession's a felony. You'll have plenty of time. In a cell? Not me. How do you figure that? I'm not some dumb dumb. I've got it all worked out. You have. I knew I could bust it someday. I figured the odds. That's why I did something about it. Tell us what you did. I made sure I always had something going for me, an ace in the hole. And you're going to play that ace now, is that it? Maybe, if you sweeten the pot. What's that mean? I told you, I've never been busted before. I don't want to be busted now. You already are. Tear up the ticket. Oh, no, not today. You haven't heard what I've got to say. That doesn't matter. You've been arrested and booked. Nothing changes that. I've heard hundreds of stories about the deals you guys make. I don't know anything about the stories you've heard, but we make no deals. Now, listen, I don't have a record. My slate's clean. A judge will take that into account. But I still go to jail? I'll be locked up? It's possible. Boy, I thought I had it all laid out. I'm even hoping you'll think what I've got is important. We'll let you know. All right. I tried to find out the name of the guy who sold me the uppers, but I couldn't. He never slipped, so I did the next best thing. What was that? 
He drives a white Dodge. I followed it. I know where he went. I memorized the address. What is it? 3245 Ascot Street. Is it important enough to put down? What was the license number? XBI 804. Is it important? Maybe. It's a lead. More than you got now. Well, I don't know. He could be just another small-time pusher. Yeah, but one thing's sure. Pushers get their supply somewhere. Yeah. Somebody makes the pills they sell.
gray-haired man in his 50s, not much to go on. Uh, looks like we got two possibilities. He'll come back to make more pills so we keep a stakeout on the place. And we check out the license number of that white Dodge. p.m. We ran a check on the license number. DMV told us it was registered to a Fred Watkins, 1612 Sycamore Street, North Hollywood. Yeah, Fred Watkins. That's right. I hope you're not selling something. You woke me up. Police officers, we'd like to talk to you. Oh. Well, come on in. What'd I do, run a red light? You own a white Dodge license number XBI 804? Well, yeah, it's downstairs. What's the matter? Something happened to it? Somebody hit it? It's all right, as far as we know. Well, what's the trouble, then? What are you here for? You lease a house at 3245 Ascot Street, do you? No, I live here. You know anybody at that address? I don't even know where Ascot Street is. Your car was seen there. Couldn't have been mine. Well, it was yours. You're kidding. It was followed there by one of the people you sold amphetamine to. Amphetamine? What's that? What do you do for a living, Fred? I'm retired. What did you do? I repaired radios. Worked at it for 30 years. Started back in the days of the old Crosleys, Atwater, Kents, Farnsworths. Those were real radios. Well-built, well-designed. Nothing cheap about any of them. They didn't have transistors in those days. Just tubes as big as light bulbs. That meant heavy chassis, heavy transformers. And we didn't fix them by simply slapping in a new part either. We fixed the old parts. I wish I had a dime for every RF coil I rewound by hand. Every IF I've rebuilt. Yeah. Those were great radios in those days. Uh-huh. Is this one of them here? One of the best they ever made. Nothing like it today. How's it sound? Good, real good. Doesn't work, though. Not anymore. It's just a memento. Mm -hmm. Well, you seem to know all about radios, Fred. What do you know about pills? What's a cartwheel? I don't know. How about a whitey? I never heard the term before. Both are street talk for amphetamine sulfate tablets. I told you. I don't know anything about that stuff. How about Thelma Benstead? Who's she? She owns that house over on Ascot Street. Oh, look, I haven't got anything to do with any house on any street. Ever been in trouble before, Fred? No, I haven't, and I'm not in trouble now. You sure about that, are you? You bet I'm sure. I haven't done anything, so you can't prove I have, no matter how hard you try. What if we want to search this place? It wouldn't worry me. In fact, go ahead. You got my permission. Fine, but listen to this first. You have the right to remain silent. If you give up the right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to speak with an attorney and to have the attorney present during questioning. If you so desire and cannot afford one, an attorney will be appointed for you without charge before questioning. Now, do you understand each of these rights I've explained to you? Sure, I understand them, but I'm still giving you permission to search the place. Start in here. Start in the bathroom. Anywhere you like. All right, Fred, fine. We'll start with your radio. Radio? Why bother with that antique? I don't know. Anybody who keeps an old-time radio without repairing it just doesn't figure to me. I didn't have the parts. You can't buy those tubes anymore. I told you I just hung on to it as a keepsake. A lot of memories there. <laughs> Is that right? You're wrong about one thing, Fred. Not many memories in these. p.m. Fred Watkins was taken down to Parker Center. Mug shots were taken and we requested the photo lab to give us a high speed rush in the hope that the landlady Thelma Benstead could identify him as the man who leased her premises. We checked with R&I. Watkins had no previous record. Now look, you won't find anything in my stuff and I ain't gonna say anything and you can't prove anything. We can prove one thing right now, possession. Well, sure, but that's all. And I got no record, so I'll get a suspended sentence. Not if we can tie you in with that factory on Ascot Street. You won't. Go ahead and try. You won't get anywhere. We think we might. Who'll say so? Somebody who says he saw me drive there? So what? I was visiting. I went to the wrong address. I stopped to ask directions. All right, Fred. Who's Michael Cooper? What? Michael Cooper. Who is he? I don't know any Michael Cooper. Well, now, he wrote you a check. $200 worth. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember now. He's a guy I loaned some money to. Maybe he's the one who makes the pills. Maybe we ought to check him out. You'll be wasting your time. Well, now, we got lots of it, Fred. Suppose you tell us where we can find him. I haven't got any idea. Not that Ascot Street address, maybe? He hasn't got anything to do with it. Well, now, somebody you. does. Suppose you tell us who. <sighs> sure, sure. All right. I do. You leased the house? That's right. For the purpose of making amphetamine sulfate tablets? Yeah. Tell us about the big man. What do you mean, big man? I don't know any big All man. All right, Fred, your partner, then. I got no partner.
partner. I ran the place myself. You mean the entire operation was yours? You ran the whole thing? That's right. All your own idea? Look, I said it was my setup, didn't I? I said I ran the whole thing myself. You bought the machines. You ordered the drugs. You did everything. Yes, I did. I did all those things. What's the matter? Don't you believe me? Oh, we might, except for one small thing. Yeah, what's that? The man who set up that factory. Now, I doubt he'd be stupid enough to stash a bag of tablets inside a radio. Now, what do you think? Joe, see you a minute. Just got back from the Benstead woman's apartment. Show her the mugs. How we doing? We're batting zero. Yeah? She swears Watkins is not the man she rented that house to. says he's responsible for the whole operation and you don't buy it. That's right. Okay, let's say you're right and I think you are. That brings us to the next question. Why is Watkins willing to take the fall? Well, he hasn't got a record and convicted he'd pull a light sentence. You think he wants to take the rap for somebody else? That's what we think. Possible it's done often enough. We think Watkins and whoever he works for had it all arranged just in case we tumble to the factory. Watkins serves a light sentence and gets a big payoff from somebody. Yes, sir, that's how we see it. Makes sense, but it raises another question. Who does he work for and how do we find him? Any ideas? One, maybe. Might pay off. What do you got in mind? So far, there are only two other names connected with this deal. Smith and Cooper. And Smith doesn't take us anyplace. That's right. But Cooper's different. Maybe. Watkins had a check from him in his pocket. It was drawn on a downtown bank. They gave us his home address. You run it down? No, sir, not yet. But we did check R&I and DMV. Michael Cooper drives the kind of car the Benstead woman remembers. A silver-gray charger. Go on. And he has a record of previous H&S violations. Sounds good, but you'll need more to tie him in. Yes, sir, but it's a start. If he's the man behind that factory, knocking it over won't sting him too bad. Yeah, we're ahead of you. He can always set up another one. 10.40 a.m. Michael Cooper lived in a Beverly Hills penthouse. His houseboy told us he could be found at a private tennis club. It wasn't hard to locate Cooper. Everybody seemed to know him. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes. You're Michael Cooper. That's right. New members? Well, welcome to the club. Let me buy you a drink. No, sir. We'd like to talk to you. All right. You're at the bar, folks. On my tab. Yes? We're police officers, Mr. Cooper. Oh, of course. I've been expecting you. Shall we sit down? I think I deserve a break. I played four sets this morning. Yes, sir. You know, great game, tennis. Keeps you young. No better way to stay in shape. You can keep your vitamin capsules and your pills. Good, clean air, regular exercise. That's the way to a full life. Yes, sir. You know the great people, tennis players. That's because it's a social activity that requires great diligence. Attracts the right kind. You seem to have a lot of friends. Oh, it's just a title. I was elected club president last month, purely an honorary position, but it is gratifying. Now, gentlemen, I know you didn't come out here to discuss tennis with tennis players. Tell me, what can I do for you? You know a man named Fred Watkins? Of course I do. And I'm sure you know that. You wouldn't be here otherwise. There's no need to be coy. I believe in being perfectly frank with everybody, and I like people who return the compliment. When did you see Watkins last? Oh, uh, seven or eight days ago, we met for lunch. But I talked to him on the phone this morning. I intend to provide legal counsel for Fred. Tell us about the house on Ascot Street. Well, what do you want to know? You don't deny knowing about it? <laughs> Certainly not. Why should I? I've committed no crime. That house was used to manufacture drugs. Do you know that? Amphetamine tablets. I know. Fred told me that this morning. I was absolutely appalled. You'd think a man Fred's age would be wiser. If I'd known that's why he wanted the house, I never would have signed the lease. You put the lease in your name, did you? That's right. I had to. You see, Fred, unfortunately, has a long record of bad debts. You'd be sure the owner of the house would never have run it to him. You were just doing him a favor, is that it? Precisely. That's your story? Of course, it's the truth. You paid the rent. You also wrote him a check for $200, is that right? That's correct. Are you wondering why? Well, there's an excellent reason. Fred and I were in the Army together, and on one occasion he saved my life. After that, of course, we became the best of friends, and we've been that way ever since. Always ready to help each other whenever the occasion arose. In short, gentlemen... I'll do anything for Fred, and he'll do anything for me. He can go to prison for you. Why, yes, now that you mention it, I'm sure he would. Now, do you have another question? I'm sure I have an answer for it. You used the name Smith on the lease. Why? Well, it's my legal name. No, it is, really. Michael Cooper Smith. I got dreadfully tired of so many raised eyebrows each time I used it. I became simply Michael Cooper. But let me assure you, Smith is still my legal name and the one by which, under law, I must sign all legal documents. Everything's strictly legal. Of course, I wouldn't have it any other way. And I know you wouldn't.
Friday, November 7th, 4 p.m. Three days had passed. So far, our investigation had turned up only one disproving fact. Neither Cooper nor Watkins had served in the Army. Joe, Bill, I'll give it to you straight. I just got back from the DA's office. While you were out in the field, I got a call from the county jail that Fred Watkins felt targeted. I went over to see him. He gave me a full cop-out. What do you have to say? According to Watkins, he talked Cooper into loaning him money. He also talked Cooper into renting that house for him. But Watkins set up that factory all by himself. Leaving Cooper in the clear. If that goes before a judge, Watkins will be convicted of everything he confessed to. He'll establish the fact that he was the only one involved in setting up that factory and the only one connected with its operation. And you know what that means. Yes, sir, we do. But have one fine time connecting Cooper with the crime afterwards. And even if we did, I can hear his lawyers now. They'd say one man had already confessed to the charges we were bringing against Cooper. They'd point out one man was already convicted on those charges and was serving time as a result. That's it. If the evidence we had was strong enough, we might get a conviction, but it wouldn't amount to much. Cooper would be out on the street in no time. Free to set up another pill plant. We need that evidence now, Joe, today, before Watkins goes to trial. We need to slam the cell door on Cooper before Watkins pleads guilty, not after. Watkins goes to trial in ten days doesn't give us much time. I know, but it's all we've got. Make it do. Work around the clock. Retrace every step you've taken. Talk to all the witnesses again. Search that house a second time and a third time if you have to, but get that evidence. We've already gone over the house with a fine-tooth comb. Only got one thing to say to that, Gannon. What's that? Get a finer comb. November 8th, 4.10 p.m. We searched the house on Ascot Street again. The machinery and other things were scheduled to go to property division the next day and be held as evidence. Anything? Not a thing. We've gone through this entire joint three times. Yeah, I know. It doesn't figure, does it? What's that? Oh, everybody makes mistakes. Cooper's no different. You're forgetting something. Yeah, what's that? He might never have been here. It's still his operation. Want to hit the bedroom again? No, whatever it is ought to be right in this room. I keep telling myself the same thing, Joe, but I don't believe me. See something? Maybe. Take a look. Manufactured by Furby Limited, Orange, New Jersey. Yeah, but that machine's years old, Joe. Could have been resold three or four times. Yeah, but that hasn't. Looks like a new motor. It's just been repaired October this year. Acme Electric, Armatures Rewound, Princess Street, Santa Barbara. Well, somebody paid to have that work done. There'll be a name on the bill for the job, won't there? So far, so good. What now? Those empty bags. We've already checked them two times. Let's make it three. 5.40 p.m. We checked 674 bags. Again, we found nothing. 775, 770. Wait a minute. What's that? Oh, just some trash that was in there before. Let's check it. Looks like somebody emptied a couple of ashtrays. Some bottle caps. Pieces of paper. Looks like a torn up calendar page. Some writing on the back. What's it say? Can you read it? One bag. And it looks like part of the word amphetamine. Let me do that. Get the rest of those pieces. Let's see if we can put something together here. There's another one. Here. This one over here. That's all there is, but it's enough. Using blender, mix one bag amphetamine. The formula for uppers. And it's going to give us one more ingredient, isn't it? Whoever wrote that formula. Monday, November 10th, 1120 a.m. We turned the formula we found over to SID. Officer Tom Evans, their handwriting expert, was ready to give us his findings. Any comparison? See for yourself. Compare the A in dollar with the A in amphetamine. Notice the shading in each. Notice the pen lift before each starting stroke. The overlap of the upstroke and the final downstroke in each. Now look at the D in dollar and the D in blender. See the loops in the vertical strokes? And notice how the down strokes fail to reach the horizontal plane before making the starting stroke of the next letter. The same thing happens with the eyes in mix and the signature. The down strokes fail to reach the horizontal. Also, both resemble inverted V's, and the fact that neither has a dot is significant. What's your conclusion, Tom? I'd say the check signed by Michael Cooper and the formula were written by the same man. Joe, Bill, Tom, Lieutenant. Tom's made his comparison the handwriting checks. In my opinion, it could be argued. It won't be. Take a look at these replies to your wife. New Jersey, Furby Limited reports selling a number of used machines to Michael Cooper Smith. Santa Barbara, Acme Electric repaired a motor for a Mr. Michael Cooper. That does it. We got a case. Only one more thing we need. Michael Cooper Smith. Pick him up.
The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 5th, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The court found the accused, Michael Cooper Smith and Fred C. Watkins, guilty on two counts of violating Section 11911 of the Health and Safety Code, possession of dangerous drugs, and guilty on two counts of violating Section 11912 of the Health and Safety Code, manufacturer of dangerous drugs. The penalties for such violations are terms in the state prison of not less than one year and not more than three. This is really getting to be the camel's back. What is? I'll tell you what is. The straw that broke the camel's back, that's what is. What's that? All this paperwork. Yeah, there sure is a lot of it, all right. A lot of it? That's all being a policeman is anymore, shuffling papers from one pile to another. You know what I think, Joe? No, what do you think? The hazard on this job isn't the criminal. It's writer's cramp, typer's knuckle. You know what it's coming to, don't you? No, partner, tell me. It's coming to the point where you're going to have to fill out a form to go to the men's room. You know what you need, don't you? What do I need? You need to go home. It's almost 5 o'clock. Yeah, I think you're right. What about you? What do you mean? What are you going to do tonight? Oh, I got night school. This is Tuesday. Your class is Thursday night. No, that was last semester. This time it's Tuesdays. Oh, what are you taking? Psychology. Well, actually, it's more of a sensitivity session. A what? Sensitivity. There are about 20 of us, and we just sit around in a big circle and talk. What about? Anything at all. You just sit around and talk, and for this you get a grade? Well, if you're just a warm body, you know you just show up for class and sit there without saying anything. The professor says he'll give you a C. Now, if you join in the conversation, participate, then you're going to get a B. Things have sure changed since I went to school. You have to do a lot more than just talk to get a B. Well, you see, the idea is to be honest. Let your hair down, you know, get to know one another. They know you're a policeman? No, nobody knows what the other one does. That's the idea. The professor says he wants us to react to the person, not to the occupation. You see? It's an interesting group of people. But are you really picking up anything you didn't already know just being on the job? No, not so much new things, just a different way of looking at old things. Well, like this one guy, Jerry, he's about 33. He admits having been busted for narcotics. He says he's taken 150 LSD trips, and the doctor told him he was psychotic. And you mean this guy copped out to all that in front of 19 other people? Oh, yeah, that's the idea. Everybody's supposed to cop out to something. Confession's good for the soul, or... Something like that. Well, that's not exactly a new idea, is it, Joe? No, no, it's been around for a while. At least I know what kind of grade I'd get in that class. You do, huh? It's obvious. The only way to get a B is to confess something, right? Yeah. Well, I'd have to take a C. You would? Of course, Joe. I have nothing to confess. Second all, 
It's a sleeping pill. We give it every day in the hospital to make people sleep. Oh, you only go to sleep because you're told you're supposed to. It's all in your mind. After two or three times, you can control it so that you're just on the edge. Then it's a groovy high and no getting sick like with booze. Anybody that believes that has got to be a fool. Tell us why, Joe. In the first place, when he's describing the part about it all being in the mind, that's just another way of saying your body builds up tolerance to second all. Now, if you take reds three days in a row, the same amount that puts you out on the first day just doesn't do it on the third day because your body has built up that tolerance to it. And anybody who's strung out on reds is really on a bad trip, fella. Yeah, man, being strung out on reds is really a bummer. Oh, baloney, the whole thing always gets back to drugs. Drugs are for cripples. And you don't take drugs? No, I don't. Not even aspirin? Not even aspirin. Never take a drink of the boys? Well, that's different. Oh, alcohol is not a drug. Well, all right then. Technically speaking, yes. Are you a cripple? No, I'm not. I'd like to ask a question. Shoot, man, I got no secrets. You said you took LSD because it enabled you to gain insights into your personality. Yeah, that's it. You told us you took it over 150 times just to know yourself better, right? Right. When I when do you think you'll get the job done? Well, what do you mean? How many more LSD drops do you think you're going to need before you know yourself? I don't know. How many times does a person have to go to a psychoanalyst before he gets his peeps out of his hair? I wouldn't know. My family was never in my hair. But then again, I didn't need an excuse to do my thing because my thing wasn't taking drugs. Oh, let's face it. The establishment is not all messed up like we are. It's all us obscene commie hippies that support the liquor industry. And it's all us obscene long hairs that draft you old folks and make you go kill innocent men, women, and children in Vietnam. I believe we discussed Jerry's debating technique last week, and I thought we'd agree to try to minimize the sarcasm. The one thing I find most interesting is apparently the one thing that has consistently been missed by the rest of you. For a moment there, I thought Bob was going to catch it. How do you mean, Professor? You said we always end up talking about dope. Isn't it also true we end up talking about Morgan? Oh, I can't help it if I'm a star, man. <laughs> Would it be a fair statement that a lot of what you say, Jerry, is just to draw attention to yourself? Getting stoned is on everybody's mind these days. That's why everybody talks about it. It's the same thing as during Prohibition. Nothing is ever the same, except dying. Care to expand on that, Norm? Jerry here is playing with his own mind and trying to convince us that he's having a good time. Yeah, man, and I'll bet you vote straight Republican and you got a sheet in your closet with eye holes. Now, you listen to me. When you walk down the street in Calcutta, you see people and you don't know whether they're sleeping or dead. And in Africa, I can get you killed for $5 American. So don't give me that song and dance about doing your own thing. Doing your own thing for most of this godforsaken world is being alive the next day. If that means blowing up some dude who's a threat to me, I'll do it. And I don't need to wear a sheet to get the job done. An eye for an eye, Norm? Call it that if you like. I think Norm's right. What are we going to do when there's so many people on the face of this earth that just by being alive, we're a threat to the survival of each other? Call war brutal, inhuman, savage, and all that other stuff. And it will be true. But war is also contraceptive. It eliminates excess population in a great big hurry. This conversation is hideous. This talk is terrible. I've spent most of my life working in hospitals, and if I believe you, why, it's brutal. You guys talk like fascists. Yeah, man, you guys pigs. That's what I call timing. All right, people, that's all for tonight. Gee, after that, I could use a cup of coffee. How about you, Joe? How about a rain check, Barbara? I gotta leave now. Oh, sure, Joe, whatever you say. Hey, Jerry, hold it up a minute. Police officer, what do you got in that notebook? Nothing, man, nothing at all. And you won't mind if I take a look, will you? What's this? <laughs> you got it all wrong, man. That's just oregano. I use it in my spaghetti. I'm a gourmet cook. Sure you are. You're under arrest for possession of marijuana. Don't try it, Jerry. Don't try it. Since I had arrested Jerry Morgan for possession for sale of marijuana. 
It was business as usual for Professor Grant's class, and everyone was there except Jerry. Barbara, how are you? Fine, how are you, Joe? Good. How about that coffee tonight? Well, I think you can make it. I think I can. Joe, may I see you in my office a moment? Well, sure, Professor. I took the liberty of pulling a transcript of your grades. Oh. You're going for your master's degree in criminology, right? Yes, sir, that's correct. But in order to get your master's degree, you'll have to maintain a B average, right? Yes, sir, that's right. I don't think you're going to be able to maintain a B average, Mr. Friday. What are you getting at, Professor Grant? Or shouldn't I call you Mr. Friday? Maybe I should address you as Sergeant Friday. Or do you prefer to be known as good old friendly Joe, the schoolboy narc? You must forgive me. I've never had a police spy infiltrate my class before. You're talking about Jerry. I'm talking about you. You deliberately infiltrated my class and used information you heard to arrest one of my students. You're a police spy. What I heard in class had nothing to do with my arresting Jerry. He had two lids of marijuana in his possession. He had it in his notebook. It was in plain sight. He took us to his apartment. We found almost a full kilo of this stuff. He's a dealer, and he does his own pushing right here on this campus. But his confessions in class had nothing to do with your arresting him. That's absolutely correct. How naive do you think I am? You violated the trust of every member of that group in there. Professor Grant, Morgan was violating the state laws. He's been charged with committing a felony. Oh, for heaven's sake, man, are we going to go through that marijuana, the killer weed routine now? There's nothing wrong with marijuana. I smoke it myself. Ten to twenty million people smoke it in the United States today. That's not what's wrong here. It's the fact that we have secret police in school. The one place we should build trust. The one place we should learn without fear. This isn't Nazi Germany or Russia. This is America, the so-called open society. Why do you slink around spying on your fellow human beings? Why don't you wear your badge so people can see what you are? This country's becoming a police state. I'll tell you one thing this country is. What's that? One of the largest consumers of drugs in the world. And that, of course, justifies secret police roaming the corridors of our schools. It doesn't seem to bother you that there are secret drug pushers walking those same corridors. That still doesn't alter the fact that you're a police spy. I'm a policeman. I'm required to be on duty 24 hours a day. Now, there's nothing secret about that. And as a doctor of psychology, I'm required to respect any confidence placed in me by another human being. Now, let me tell you how it's going to be, Sergeant. Number one, I'll appear in Jerry's behalf in court and testify as to how you got your information that he's a user of narcotics. He's a pusher. And I'll explain to the rest of the class that you've decided not to attend anymore, which, of course, will earn you a failing grade. You don't have to explain anything to the class. I'm not dropping out. Class doesn't want you, Friday. You're a narc, and the class doesn't want you. Let them tell me that. You're a glutton for punishment, aren't you? I forgot you're a policeman. You need proof positive. All right? Have it your way. And how will that be? Let's put it to a vote. Or do you lack the guts, Sergeant? In case some of you haven't noticed, Jerry Morgan is not with us tonight. The reason is because this man arrested Jerry last Tuesday night after class. Because Jerry had a little grass in his notebook. This man is Sergeant Joe Friday of the Los Angeles Police Department. This man has been sitting in class with you, taking down all you say, hunting for something to use against you. This man is a narc. Now, after showing you all how much he trusts you, he comes before you to ask that you allow him to stay in the class. He wants you to trust him again. He wants you to put it to a vote. All right, if I say something. Anything you care to, Sergeant. I'm a policeman going to school. I saw marijuana in Jerry Morgan's possession. It was in plain sight. I arrested him according to the law. You people pay my salary to do just that. I'm in class for exactly the same reason all of you are, to try and get a passing grade and to learn something. Is that all, Sergeant? Yes, sir, that's all. Very well. All those in favor of allowing Sergeant Friday to remain in this class, raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six. All opposed. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And three abstentions. That makes it nine to six. He goes. Don't forget your notebook, Sergeant. Where would a policeman be without his notebook? Joe, why don't you go see the captain? Joe? What? Why don't you go see the captain about this school thing? No. 
Well, you better do something. You've been this way a week now, and I'm getting worried about you. There's nothing to worry about, Bill. Why don't you go see the captain? It isn't my way. All right, but you got to do something to get this thing off your back. I am going to do something. What? I don't know. I haven't got it all sorted out yet. What's to sort? You did what you were supposed to do. You did your job. From what you've told me about this group, all they do is sit around and try turning wrong into right. I just knew there was no way you could get a bee sitting around talking. I thought we got rid of you last week, Friday. What do you want this time? Another vote. Another vote? What makes you think another vote is going to come out any different than the last one? I want to talk to that group in there, and then I want another vote. You're kidding yourself. You've got to be some kind of masochist. You've got to enjoy being humiliated in front of all those people in there. No, sir, I don't enjoy that one pound. I don't see why I should allow it. You've been thrown out of the class, you've been expelled. Why don't we let it go at that? Because both you and I know you did a number on me last week. After what you said and the way you said it, I didn't stand much of a chance, not did I? Are you saying I deliberately distorted the facts? Are you claiming that you're not now a policeman or ever were a policeman during the three months you've been attending my class? Oh, come on, Professor Grant. You know I'm not working undercover in this school. And how am I supposed to know that? Well, you pulled a transcript of my grades. It says right there that I'm a policeman with the city of Los Angeles. That's not where I found out. Jerry called me after his attorney got him released on a writ. But you could have found out any time by just pulling that transcript, now, couldn't you? So? Well, if I were an undercover narcotics officer, don't you think I'd play it a little better than that? I had no reason to pull your grades until this happened. Now, look, Professor Grant, it's the principle of the thing, right? Most certainly is. Then what have you got to lose by putting it to a vote again? Unless you're afraid I'll swing a couple over to my side. All right, we'll do it. But you'll have to swing more than a couple to stay in class. How do you mean that? You've got to get a full two-thirds of that vote. Two-thirds? Take it or leave it, Sergeant. Sergeant Friday here has accused me of being unfair to him in my remarks last week. And he'd like to see if he can convince some of you to join his point of view. The good sergeant would like another vote to see if he'll be allowed to stay in this class. For what purpose? I haven't the faintest idea. Unless he's got his eye on making another bust. Sergeant? All right. Let me say for the record, if you vote to let me come back to this class, and I see anybody else holding, I'll arrest him just the same as I did Jerry Morgan. But why should we let you come back at all? Tell me, what's the idea of this class? To get to know each other, right? Well, I'm a policeman. Now, you ask any question, as long as it doesn't involve a case now under investigation or before the courts, and I'll tell it just like it is. Do you like being a policeman, Joe? Sometimes, no. Sometimes it hurts. Why are you, then? Because it's my profession. Kicking little people around. You consider somebody who sells narcotics as one of the little people, do you? Yeah, man. If somebody wants to smoke a little dope or drop a pill, who's the victim? The guy who's doing it. Now, shouldn't he have the right to do anything he wants with his own body? Man, it's a crime without a victim. When you say using dope is a crime without a victim, who's picking up the tab for all the lost wages, the stolen property, and the destroyed lives? How many overdoses have you seen come through your hospital, Barbara? Quite a few. How many die? Too many. Kids? Most of them. The county of Los Angeles is spending over a million dollars a month just handling kids who use and sell dope. Now, who's the victim? We are. All of us. Sergeant, I'd like to ask you a question. Okay, ask it. If you were the chief of police, how would you handle the narcotics problem? Pretty much the way it's being handled today. I disagree. We need tougher laws. We should really crack down on them. Maybe so. But half of you people in this room are in an uproar because I enforced one of the laws already on the books. Let's get to the bottom line here. The law, your law, tells us we're supposed to arrest people when they commit crimes, when they break those laws. We arrest them, and the courts don't see fit to punish them. Or if they do and they're sent to prison, it doesn't seem to do any good because every year there are more and more people breaking the law. And every year we're finding it more difficult to recruit policemen because they don't want to put up with the frustration, public apathy and the abuse and the low wages. Now, I don't like being called a pig any more than some of you like being called a female dog's relative. Tell me something, Sergeant. What's your personal opinion of marijuana? We already know your official opinion. Prejudice. Now why do you say that? I see the results every hour, on the hour, every day. The kids, I've seen what it does to them. Every time you pick up a youngster who's dropping acid, nine out of ten times he's holding marijuana. I judge weed by the company it keeps. I think it's about time we put this to a vote. I'd like to say one more thing, if it's all right. All right, get it over with. Nine of you people think I violated your trust by arresting Jerry Morgan. Okay, 
But when did we vote to suspend the laws of the state of California? I haven't missed a class here. Now, when did we do that? You don't like the laws on marijuana, then you and your friends get together and you change them. Now, this question of trust. Isn't trust another word for responsibility? Well, I have responsibility that I've sworn to uphold. That's my trust. What about Jerry Morgan's responsibilities? As a citizen, he's supposed to obey the law. That's his trust. Now, when I gave my oath, I agreed to enforce all the laws, not just the ones I agreed with. I think you people paying the bills have a right to expect me to live up to my word. Now, we've been rapping on and on about doing our own thing. Well, that's my own thing. Keeping the faith, baby, with the people of this city. Thank you for listening to me. All right. All those in favor of expelling Sergeant Friday once and for all, raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And all those in favor of letting him stay, raise your hands. Seven, eight. Eight to eight. That makes it a tie. I believe we had an agreement. Just a minute. Where are you going, Sergeant? The vote was even. Friday made a deal. He had to get a two-thirds vote to stay in this class. Who wrote that rule? I agreed to it. Well, I didn't. I've been sitting through this silly mess for a week now. I wanted to see what kind of a policeman this man really is. I wanted to wait and see if he'd take this nonsense that's been thrown at him or if he was really interested in remaining in this class, if he'd come back. Well, he didn't disappoint me. He's back, he's interested, and he's going to stay. For the record, I'm a practicing attorney attending his class for the same reasons as the rest of you, to learn about human nature. Well, I just took a postgraduate course with this ridiculous display. Now, let me spell this out for you people in simple English. This man will be allowed to stay in this class and complete the semester and receive a grade commensurate with his ability in this particular subject. Or I'm prepared to file charges against you, Professor Grant, on his behalf. Charges? What charges? Denying him an education because of his occupation. A couple of fancy words for that, Professor. It's called job discrimination. That's fine, coming from you. You didn't even vote. Certainly I didn't. Why? Neither you nor any of the people in this class can vote this man out. Policemen have constitutional rights, too. Or didn't you know that? Section 11530.5, possession for sale of marijuana. March 5th, it was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of Administrative Vice Division. The boss is Captain Nelson. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Captain Nelson had received a call from the manager of a large downtown hotel. The manager, a Mr. Green, reported that a number of his guests had been heavy losers in a high-stakes poker game being run by professional gamblers. The card parlor was a Los Angeles residence. The victims, all strangers in town, had no idea where the house was located. Yeah, they dropped a little dough, didn't they? Five thousand forty-seven hundred thirty-three fifty. Comes to almost twenty grand. Probably a lot more the hotel manager didn't hear about. What kind of convention is it, Captain? Bunch of farm equipment dealers from the Middle West. Manager says they're money heavy. Get together once a year for a big celebration. Yeah, that farm equipment business is sure booming. Is that so? You guys priced a hay banner recently or a mechanical cotton picker? Well, I haven't. Cost you a fortune. Is that so? Checked it out last night. Where did you check it out? My seed catalogs. Get two or three every year about this time through the mail. 
The victims all describe the location the same way. Steep hill, narrow street, a lot of turns. Nobody sure which direction or how far the house is from the hotel. Drove them around circles, no doubt, going and coming. And they'd probably had a few. I'm surprised they remember as much as they do. What about the house itself, Skipper? Modern. One of those cantilever jobs sticks out over 500 feet of nothing. Hollywood Hills, maybe. More than likely, but I want to know. Find that game and sit in on it, and then bust it, and quit. Looks like we're delegates to a convention. Right. Figure out a cover story, then check into the hotel. It's packed, but the manager said he'd find you a room. He'll give you the proper credentials. We'll arrange a meet later. The taxpayers came up with this gambling money if you find any action. Three thousand bucks, and I want most of it back. Yes, sir. You mentioned some shells. That's the one thing the victims aren't complaining about. How many girls are they working? Several. They make their contacts in the hotel bar. Different girls every night. One more thing. Gambling in a big city is like cancer. Yes, sir. Clap a lid on this thing before it spreads. <laughs> Posing as prospective buyers of farm equipment, checked into the hotel. Our credentials would state that we were observers only at the dealer's convention. I hope you gentlemen have reservations. Yes, sir, we do. Ryan and Frazier, Porterville, California. Oh, yes, I was told to expect you. You're pre-registered gentlemen in room 726. Thank you. I hope you won't be too uncomfortable. It's all we had left. Beg your pardon? Room 726, right next to the elevator shaft. Excuse me, gentlemen. I'm Tom R. Bird, Connect, Missouri. Fellows farm for a living? Oh, a little bit. When we're not drinking whiskey or playing cards, I'm Bill Ryan. Pleased to meet you, Bill. This is my partner, Joe Fraser. Fraser? How are you? You a salesman, Tom? Yep. Thunder tractors. Finest machines ever built. Wouldn't have one on the place. Ah. You sure you're a farmer, Bill? You ever hear of California oranges? Sure. I invented them. <laughs> we came down here to look at some farm equipment. We'd like to talk to you a little later. Why, well, anytime. I'll be in the bar. Sounds fine. Great. Thunder tractors. Uh-oh. What's the matter? Fresh fruit, my allergy. Oh, I didn't know about that one. Oh, sure. I get hives from just reading my seed catalogs. Do me a favor, will you, Joe? What's that? Just put it in the bathroom. <laughs> I don't dare touch it, you know. Well... It kind of tears our cover story, doesn't it? What do you mean? Well, a farmer who's allergic to fresh fruit. Just put it in the bathroom, will you, Joe? What was that, an earthquake? What was that? What was that? I dropped my toothbrush. That was the elevator, Joe, like the man told you. We're right next to the shaft. And that's the telephone, Joe. Bill Ryan. Yes, sir, got in a few minutes ago. Mr. Green, the hotel manager, wants to know if he can come up. Anytime. Sure, anytime, Mr. Green. Right. Oh, by the way, we've got a basket of fruit in the bathroom. Right, my partner put it in there. As a rule, no. Yes, sir, appreciate it very much. What was that all about? Well, you know, Mr. Green sent that basket of fruit up to the room as a gift for you. I know, you? I know. I saw his card. Mm -hmm. He thinks you're kind of eccentric. At 8.30 p.m., Bill and I entered the hotel bar, where we hoped to make contact with a shill from the poker game. Good evening, gentlemen. Well, I thought we'd have to fight our way in here tonight. Yeah, where is everybody? Read your program. There's a big bag of upstairs. When did we eat last? Eating, we can do at home. Give me a double scotch on the rock, splash of water. Make it a pair, and the young lady, make her happy, too. Yes, sir. Boy, oh, boy. Easy, pal. You're a happily married man. You know that for a fact, too. Yes, I know that for a fact. Yes, you know that for a fact. I got the greatest wife in the world. Wouldn't trade her for a million bucks. But that blonde's a pretty girl, too. She'll do. Reminds me of a gal I used to go with. Before you were married. Of course, before I was married. Margot the Magnificent. Heck of a good little actress. Blonde hair, green eyes. Built like Theda Barra. We had a real thing going there. Yeah, what happened? Raided her theater one night. Had to haul her in. I see. Yeah, she was a headliner, I was a cop. Too bad. Same old story, Joe. What's that? Career conflict. The gentleman next door. Thank you. Thank you. To the first friendly face we've seen in L.A. To Margot. You know, he gets worse if you pay any attention to him. I'll remember that. I'm Dottie Taylor. 
Joe Fraser. Missouri, Kansas, or Arkansas? California. We raise orange juice. Aren't you at the wrong convention? Any convention will do, sweetheart, as long as it's out of town. Right, Joe? Yeah, at least one mile. Meet the brains of this outfit. Bill Ryan. Hi, Bill. Where in California? Porterville. Great place if you're an orange. I bet you've got quite a reputation there. Shrewd businessman, lousy poker player, married, but right now I'm not at home. Should we ditch this guy? I'll think about it. Bartender. Why so formal? Name's Harry. I'm Joe Harry. By the bar, a drink. What are you celebrating? A smile. Twelve thirty a.m. If Dorothy Taylor was shilling for the poker game, she kept it a secret. The only action she claimed to know about was in the hotel bar. Come here. just going to say that a girl could get in trouble in here. Right, let's go someplace else. I know, wherever there's a card game. Or a crap table. I'm very big with dice, you know. Is that why you gamble, Joe? To feel big? You know, I never really thought about it. You're lying. I know. You guys are running me out of change. Haven't you ever seen a hundred dollar bill? Saw one about a year ago, but now two in one night. The orange business must be good. The orange business is lousy. Ask Tom here. You're right. See there, I told you. Told me what? You can be nice when you want to be. I think you're a phony, Ryan. That calls for an explanation, Mr. Arbert. You said that you and your partner were down here from Porterville to buy some equipment. Isn't that what you said? That's exactly what I said. But every time I start trying to talk equipment to you, you change the subject. That set me to thinking. Is that so? Yes, sir. And I don't believe a word of it. Now, wait a minute, Tom. It's all right, Harry. Let him sound off. Just what do you believe, Mr. Robert? I'll tell you what I believe. You and your partner don't have any notion in this world of buying a tractor or anything else. You're down here to gamble, drink whiskey, and chase women, period. Now, ain't that right? What do you think, partner? Well, you can't hit a man for telling the truth, can you? Of course I can't. I apologize, Tom. You're absolutely right. Spoken like a real gentleman. Now, I want to say something. Speak up. I'll buy a drink. And I'll drink it. And he'll help. On that friendly little note, I'll say goodnight. Well, what's your hurry? I go to work early. It's almost one o'clock. What do you do? You might like it, but you wouldn't understand it. So why talk about now, it? Now, with a statement like that, you expect me to let you go? Gamblers make lousy lovers, Joe. I may kill myself. <laughs> Please don't. You talk me out of it. I've had a ball, Joe. And thanks for the drink. Anytime. So long, Farmer. So long, lady. Hey, where's she going? I don't know. She didn't say. Just when I was fixing to rescue her. Well, maybe she got wind of your plan. Sure looked nice when we got away there, Joe. Yeah, do you know her? Never saw her before. Come here. I want to ask you something, Harry. Let me guess. You're looking for action, right? Keep talking. You're going to ask me if I know where there's a poker game. High stakes, right? You just made yourself 20 bucks. Don't reach for it, pal. Why not? Because the answer is no, my friend. Is that so? Poker may be legal where you come from, but in L.A., it's against the law. Two ten a.m. The hotel bar was closed. Bill and I returned to our room. You really struck out there, didn't you? Oh, I don't know. I'm not so sure. What do you mean you're not so sure? She walked out on you, didn't she? Yeah, she did. You just can't admit defeat, can you, buddy? I guess I'll have to. Boy, she sure reminded me of Margot. Same hair, same eyes, same build. Yeah, I know. You told me. I wish we had a deck of cards. Why? I'm rusty, that's why. When was the last time you played poker? I mean, when you weren't on a case. In the Army, and that was a long time ago. That's what I figured. In my bag, right on top there. I don't know what you'd do without me. Poker, according to Hoyle. I must say, you think of everything. I try, Joe. I try. Yes, sir, she's probably the best lead we'll get. And you really struck out. Bill Ryan. Oh, hi, honey. Yeah, he's here. It's for you. Dottie? Why, no, the Queen of England. Hello? Yeah, lady. No, it's not too late for us. Yeah. In about five minutes, we'll be right down. Anything? We got the nod. We're invited to a game. Taylor picked Bill and me up in front of the hotel. She said the reason she hadn't invited us to the game before is that it had to be cleared with her boss. 
We drove in a westerly direction from downtown L.A. 2.45 a.m., after a roundabout trip, we arrived at 702 South Dixieland Road up in the Hollywood Hills. Let me do that for you. Thanks. I'm the keeper of the key. House rules. Just trying to help. Don't worry. You helped. I did. You brought your money, didn't you? Not nearly as much as I plan to take away. Gamblers. Where's your lookout? Why? Well, it's customary, isn't it? It's a friendly little game in a private residence. Now, what do we need with a lookout? Tell them the rest of it. You were personally selected. Is that what you mean? That's what I mean. Boy, were you personally selected. The door, lady. After you, gentlemen. That's what I love, the sound of a friendly little game. Go ahead, they're open. Well, aren't you going to wish me luck? I hope you lose your shirt. Well, thank you, lady.
7 a.m., Captain Nelson came over to the hotel. We discussed plans for an early morning raid at the house on Dixieland Road. We'll be in position at 12.45 a.m. Now, when we get your signal... What is that? The elevator, Captain. Right next door. Max up. Wait till you hear down. They could have felt that in Tokyo. Now, where were we? The signal. Oh, yeah. Are you sure they don't use a lookout? No, sir. We didn't see any. The girl says no, and I believe her. She also told you that the games were straight. She thinks they are. Okay. Now, the signal. There's a service entrance in the kitchen. I'll hit the porch light a couple of three times. Now, that's the best way for you to come in. They keep the front pretty well locked up. Good. Now, what's the story on the dice, Bill? They've been shaved. From the way they fall, I'd say about 40,000. Stiffs roll the flats, housemen the squares. And I'm with Joe. That girl doesn't know. Okay, then. We're all set. Uh, see you tonight. You know, I was just thinking... No, I guess not. What's that, Captain? I was going to wish you a good night's sleep. Midnight, we return to the Hollywood Hills residence. 12.35 a.m., Nate Calvin, employing several different sets of marked cards, had relieved me of more than $1,000 that belonged to the taxpayers of Los Angeles. you are. Another hundred. And I call. Ace high straight. You aren't kidding. But I'm standing short, huh? Afraid so. Four sixes. Something told me. I'm glad you aren't listening. <laughs> You're in a rut, Fraser. Yeah. Where are you going? Coffee. Keep your seat. Harry will get it for you. Not going broke fast enough for you, is that it? Coffee's in the kitchen. I'll manage it. How do you like that? Pitiful. I need a drink, Joe. I'll stick with coffee. Let me have one of those three dollar specials of yours. Yes, sir. Surely I bet you don't farm any better than you roll those dice. I like to think so. Pig's eye. What'd you say? Tell the truth, Ryan. You never have even been on a farm, have you? Is that what you think? Yeah. And something else. You gamble like I slop hogs. Ryan, just how do you make your living? Harry? Yes, sir. For two nights now, I've had a bug in my ear, and it's starting to bother me. Is that right? Yeah, and if somebody doesn't make it stop buzzing real quick-like, I'm going to pull it out and stomp on it. Is that clear? What do you mean? 
Take a look at these. The top four cards. Do you know what they are? How would I? Ace of hearts. Ten of clubs. Jack of spades. Five of diamonds. Oh, how did you know? The floral design. In the upper left-hand corner, there's a series of dots. Look close. They're so tiny. Yeah, but big enough. Right, Nate? Real brainy, ain't I? Well, you're a big girl. It's my own fault. I saw dollar signs in front of my eyes instead of spots. You're not the only one. What do they do to me, Joe? I wouldn't know. That's not my department. I hate it. I've always hated it. Then why didn't you get out? I tried. Believe me, Joe, I tried to get out. Well, you finally made it. held a Department 184 Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was found guilty of grand theft by trick or device and unauthorized possession of a deadly weapon, which is punishable by imprisonment in the state prison for not less than one year nor more than ten years. Was found guilty of change to protect the innocent. Tuesday, March 14th, we were working the day watch out of Burglary Auto Theft Division. The boss is Captain Mack. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. It was 9.20 a.m. Bill had his problems. What's the matter? You got a stiff neck? No, I always sit this way. Of course I've got a stiff neck, Joe. And it's Eileen's fault. Is that right? She's a fresh air fiend. Claims she can't sleep unless the window's wide open. Doesn't matter how cold it is, she's got to have fresh air. You know that stuff can kill you? What stuff? What stuff? I'll tell you what stuff. Fresh air. Cold, fresh air. It gets right into the bone. You know, before you get married, there's certain things you got to find out. After, it's too late. Well, now, are you getting ready to tell me about the birds and the bees? No, Joe. One, you've got to find out if she can cook. Nowadays, girls can't cook. You find a cook, marry her. Two. Find out if you enjoy the same TV shows. You think that's terribly important, do you? Well, you bet. Joe, what do you do on a date? We go out to dinner, maybe take in a movie or a play. Exactly. But wait until you get married and have a couple of kids, and you won't be floating around every night. I don't go out every night. Don't interrupt, Joe. I'm making a point. The point is, when you get married, you'll stay home with your wife and watch TV. And if you don't like the same shows, Joe, you'll be like two strangers. You in one room watching your shows, her in another room watching her shows. It's no good, Joe. Friday. Pick up two. This Friday. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I see. Uh-huh. What were those theaters again? I understand, sir. Yes, sir. We'll get right on it. It was Captain Jokish, Wilshire Division. They've been answering quite a few calls lately from movie houses out there. What's the story? Somebody's been busting into theater display cases and stealing movie posters and pictures. What do they figure? Well, the first couple of times, they thought it might be malicious mischief, but it looks like a pattern's forming. In the past couple of weeks, four theaters and other divisions have been hit. The Carlton, the Mercury, the Vineland, and the Rivoli. Last night, whoever it is hit the Rex Theater. Where's the Rex? Over on Clark, near Foster. The manager's name is Dave Breslin. Remember to keep the window up on your side of the car. It 
was 9.50 a.m. when we arrived at the Rex, a neighborhood movie theater. Mr. President? Yes, that's right. Police officers, this is Sergeant Friday. My name's Gannon. You mean detectives? Yes, sir, that's right. Look at this mess. Just look at it. Yes, sir. Would you mind filling us in? I already told the uniform men everything. Yes, sir, but would you tell us? Sure, all the display material for our current attraction. You know, photos, silk screen posters. Somebody stole it all. And that's all they took. Captain Lightning versus the Martian Devils. I see. Yeah, he's on TV now. One of those superheroes who can make himself invisible and move at the speed of lightning. Kids still go for that stuff nowadays, huh? Well, they like him on TV. Show's a big hit. But we're actually getting in more adults for the feature. Yes, sir. Is there anyone you think might have done this? Maybe some youngster you've been having trouble with? No, not really. Oh, we get the usual horseplay at the Saturday matinees. Kids throwing their popcorn boxes at the screen when the villain shows up or booing when the good guy kisses the girl instead of his horse. The kids still stick their gum on the bottom of the seats. But we've never had any problem with them cutting up the seats or clogging up the plumbing like some of the other theaters have. No, we get a pretty good group of youngsters in here. We've never had this kind of problem with the Rex. Never. Just last week, I was talking to Jack Bell. He's the manager over at the Carlton Theater, and he told me someone had busted into his display cases. He was really sore about it, and I tried to calm him down just a week ago. And now it's my turn, and I'm really sore. I mean, what sort of punk would do all this damage just for a few crummy photos? Somebody who wanted them pretty bad. It was 10.45 a.m. when we got back to burglary division to write a follow-up report. You know something? When I was a kid, I belonged to the Captain Lightning fan club. It was called Captain Lightning's Light Brigade. I still remember, for 25 cents, you got a code ring and your own personal coded message. Know what our motto was? Lightning strikes against the forces of evil, twice. <laughs> Is that right? Joe, don't you really remember Captain Lightning? It was before my time. Before your time? How old do you think I am? I know how old you are. Now, what's that supposed to mean? Just that I know how old you are. I'm hardly an old man, Joe. I know. Guy gets a stiff neck, you probably figure it's old age catching up with him. Actually, I'm in my prime. Being mature isn't the same as being elderly. I agree. You really don't remember Captain Lightning. He was sensational. Could make himself invisible. The bad guys never had a chance. Captain Lightning was the sort of fellow a boy could look up to, you know what I mean? We had heroes in those days. Now the movies are full of what they call anti-heroes. Today in the movies, a cowboy wearing a white hat rides into town. The first thing he does is shoot a dog or rob a bank. It's no wonder the kids are confused. Burglary Friday. Uh-huh. I see. Let me have that address, please. And your name? Yes, sir. In about 15 minutes. What do you got? Hollywood Arts Bookshop. Window smash. <laughs> We arrived at the Hollywood Arts Magazine shop on West Melrose at 12.10 p.m. The owner, George Gervey, explained that on weekdays he didn't open for business until noon. When he arrived at a quarter to 12 to open up, he discovered that someone had beaten him to it. He came right through that window, busted it out. Can you beat that right through a man's window? You don't have an alarm system? No, I've been thinking of putting one in, but I just never got around to it. What have you found missing? Well, I've been trying to figure that out. Come on in, we can cry in my office. I'm not complaining, mind you, but as close as I can figure with just a spot check, I got off pretty lucky. How's that, sir? Well, whoever it was didn't touch a copy of Wonder Stories or Amazing Stories, and they go for several dollars each. And I got some books that are true collector's items, autographed first editions. Any collector would have gone for those first. I don't understand it. Well, just what is missing, Mr. Gervy? About 70, 80 comic books. What sort of comic books were they? I mean, the titles. Oh, a few wizard boys, maybe a dozen Commander Jupiters, and the rest all Captain Lightning. Captain Lightning. Took all I had, about 60 of them. Anything else? No. Wait a second, will you look at that? At what? I had a feeling there was something else missing. Kept it right here, nice bright colors. Now it's gone. What's that, sir? I had a good-sized poster up here. Captain Lightning, big as life. Now it's gone, isn't it? Looks that way. And maybe Captain Lightning can make himself invisible, but not his poster. Sergeant Friday? Yes, that's right. Can I help you? Oh, uh, Lieutenant Murrow suggested I talk to you. My name's Bob Snow. Sit down, Bob. Uh, the whole thing's so nutty, I'm not sure where to begin. I go to UCLA, business administration major. Weeknights, I work at the Arcadia Theater. It's over on Benson Avenue. I'm sort of the manager. I take tickets, work the candy counter, change the marquee. 
Well, last night after the last show, I was changing the marquee, and I remember I was just to the Ellen Harlow. Harlow? Gene Harlow. Oh, yeah, Gene Harlow. We show a lot of old movies at the Arcadia. Well, our next bill is Grand Hotel and Dinner at 8. It opens tonight. And like I say, I was up there on the ladder, and I had already done Greta Garbo and John Barrymore, when this guy runs under my ladder, picks up all the display art I've got piled on the ground, and takes off like a big bird. The display art? Well, I'd already pinned up all the still photos and the posters for Grand Hotel and Dinner at 8, but I left all the stuff from the previous bill on the ground. What was the previous bill? Perils of Astroman and Captain Lightning versus the Martian Devils. Well... They're not all classics at the Arcadia. Can you describe the man? Well, you're not going to believe me, I'll tell you that. Try us. We never saw anything like it. For one thing, he was wearing a bright green cape. A cape? And a three-cornered black hat. You know, like Napoleon. Only there was some sort of a design on it. An insignia. And a long white plume in the hat. Whew. Weird, I'll tell you. Anything else? Well, he was carrying a little black bag, like a doctor. I was so surprised, I nearly fell off my ladder. He held the cape up to hide his face. You know, like, like the black shadow. You didn't see his face? No way. Not with the cape pulled up. He was wearing that dopey hat and all the rest of that jazz. But I didn't really see him. Was he tall, short? He seemed to be built pretty close to the ground. I'd say he was short, I guess. And kind of chubby. Joe, looks like Superfan has struck again. Somebody broke into the still department at Continental Studios last night. Think it's the same guy? Could be. We don't know. We'll take a run out there. All right. Maybe you think it's funny that I didn't climb down off that ladder and catch that goof, but there was no way, I tell you. No way. Is that right? Yeah, he moved like lightning. We left Parker Center and drove out to the San Fernando Valley to the Continental Studios. When we arrived at the motion picture studio, the guard directed us to the publicity office where the burglary had occurred. Must be some nutty kid. There's a lot of them around these days. Had to be a kid. The only photos he took were Captain Lightning. Captain Lightning? Yeah, we produced a TV series out here. That's all the kid was after, pictures of Captain Lightning. How was entry made? Well, that window. Appears to me Jimmy did open. How do you spell your name, Mr. Kelly? Two E's? No, one E. K-E-L-L-Y. Looks like a pry bar. Good 15-foot drop to the street down there. No standby. It must have a job scale on that wall. You didn't find a ladder outside that window. No, but whoever did this certainly could have used one. They're all over the lot. Joe, what's that look like to you? Red candle wax. That's the way I make it. A burglar with a candle. From what we've heard of this guy, nothing would surprise me. You mind if we take this along? We'll return it to you. Well, you don't have to return that. It's just a picture of the back lot. Thank you. Say, Sergeant Friday, I just thought of something. Yes, sir, what's that? Well, maybe it doesn't mean anything, but it's been on my mind since we discovered the only things missing are the Captain Lightning photos. Yes, sir, go on. Last Monday, I think it was, a guy came in to ask if he could buy some photos or posters of Captain Lightning. I explained to him that we don't sell them to the general public, but we supply them to magazines and newspapers and theaters for publicity purposes. He got pretty upset, came all unglued. When I suggested he might find what he was looking for in some of those bookstores and poster shops on Hollywood Boulevard... He said he wasn't interested because anyone on the street could buy those pictures. He said he was a collector, not a typical fan. Those are the words he used. I gotta say, though, that he didn't seem the sort to bust through windows. He was no Doug Fairbanks. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, he was a little guy on the chunky side. I, I just don't see him pulling a burglary. How old would you say he was? Mm, maybe 22 or 23. Can you remember anything else about him? Well, his hair was dark and kind of curly, and I think he was trying to grow a mustache, but without too much success. He had long sideburns like everybody's wearing. Like I say, he was kind of on the chunky side and kind of short, maybe 5'7 or 5'8". Now, I'm not too good on guessing weights. Any other identifying marks or scars? No, not that I recall. Guys like that always strike me as kind of strange. Getting so excited about Captain Lightning. A lot of nuts around these days. I'd say he's a real pistachio. Yes, sir. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I got the feeling this guy's entire thrust centered around this comic strip character. Well, I mean, he got so upset when I told him we couldn't let him have the pictures. To tell you the truth, I was afraid he was gonna have a breakdown right then and there. He really teared up and started to sob. Did he say anything else? Yeah, he did. I told him not to worry about it, that Captain Lightning wasn't the only thing in life, and he said, he is to me, and he turned and walked out. I felt sorry for the guy. He really had his heart set on getting those pictures. What do you think, Sergeant? Sounds a little psycho, doesn't he? Maybe. Anything strange about the way he was dressed? No, nothing strange. How do you mean? Was he wearing a costume or a cape? No, perfectly ordinary sport jacket, open-collared sports shirt, dark trousers. Still room, Kelly. He's right here. It's for you, Sergeant. Thank you. This Friday. Where? 
Yeah, I got it. We'll go right over. Thanks, Merv. Super fan. They just collared him at the Variety Theater. into Hollywood to the Variety Theater. The suspect was captured by Mr. Webster here, the manager of the theater. That's right. Of course, I didn't do anything very heroic. I was just coming to work when I heard the sound of glass breaking. I saw this kid standing there with a brick or something in his hand. I could see he was harmless, so I walked over and grabbed him. I told Duke, our janitor, to call the police, and this fellow arrived a minute later. That's all there was to it. He was clean except for this doctor's bag. A lot of junk in it, all harmless, except maybe for this grappling hook. Did you get anything out of him? No, sir. I gave him his rights and he waved him. I just started to question him when you arrived. What's your name? Come on, fellow. What's your name? All the details will come out in due time. It's due time now, fellow. What's your name? Well, gentlemen, you've captured the Crimson Crusader. And I'm powerless to act for you anymore. The Crimson Crusader? Me. Forty-five p.m., we again advised the suspect of his rights. He freely confessed to breaking into the Continental Studios. He admitted stealing pictures and posters from several movie theaters over the past several weeks, but he kept insisting that the Crimson Crusader was his true name. How much longer are you going to detain me here? How much longer are you going to insist your name is the Crimson Crusader? My name is the Crimson Crusader. Now, let me see if I've got this straight, fella. Your family name is Crusader, and your parents named you Crimson. Is that what you're trying to sell us? Come on, what's your real name? You know I can't tell you that. You gentlemen more than anyone should realize I can't disclose my true identity. And what's that? Can't you tell? Tell what? I'm on your side. Is that so? Of course. Because it would destroy my effectiveness as a crime fighter if my true identity were known. Come again? We're on the same side. I'm a crime fighter. But it's essential that the underworld not know my everyday identity. You wouldn't expect Captain Lightning or Commander Jupiter to disclose their identities, would you? Why do you insist on the Crimson Crusader doing it? All right, now you've had your fun, Mr. Crusader. Understand this. We didn't bring you down here to compare notes. You're a thief and you're under arrest. Now let's have your name. Very well. And I want you to realize that you'll be the only policeman in this city who will know my real name. I'm putting you on your honor. No one else in this whole world knows the Crimson Crusader's true identity. There are gangland bosses who'd pay a fortune to know what I'm about to tell you. I want you to swear now. I want your word of honor. Here's the word, fella. We want your name and we want it right now, or we'll let you sit for a few hours until you feel like pulling it up. Stanley Stover. What's that? If you'd give me a pencil and paper, I'd prefer writing it down rather than to shout it. Why don't you just spell it? Capital S-T-A-N-L-E-Y. Capital S-T-O-V-E-R. Now, don't repeat it, please. How old are you, Stanley? Softly, please. I'm 23. Why did you steal all those pictures and posters? I didn't steal them. I'm a collector. We call it stealing. You broke into a movie studio, a bookstore, you damaged half a dozen theaters. Now, is that your idea of fighting crime, Stanley? I'd be willing to pay the damages. I could save up and pay them off. Or I could go to work for the theaters. What do you mean, go to work for them? Well, I'd give them protection. There'd be very little crime around those theaters with the Crimson Crusader on the job. Why did you steal all those things? I'm a collector. Stanley, you've got to understand you're in trouble. We want straight answers. We want to know why you've been stealing all of this Captain Lightning stuff. What makes it so important that you are willing to risk jail for it? I wanted them. They were important to me. Why only comic strip heroes? How come you only collected their pictures? Because... Because they're great men. They can fly and walk through walls, and nothing can hurt them, nothing. And do you want to walk through walls and fly? Nothing can hurt them. And when I'm the Crimson Crusader, I'm one of them. And nothing can hurt me. And when you're Stanley Stover? Then everything hurts. What am I? Look at me. I'm a short, ugly guy. When I put on the uniform of the Crimson Crusader, I wasn't Stanley Stover anymore. I was 10 feet tall. I had muscles of steel. There wasn't anything I couldn't do. 
Taking those pictures didn't seem wrong. Captain Lightning, Wizard Boy, Super Flame, they weren't just my heroes. They were friends, and having their pictures, pictures no one else had, it made me feel closer to them. It didn't seem wrong. I didn't hurt anyone. I never hurt anybody. How long have you been stealing pictures and posters? They started when I was a kid. 10, maybe 11. Not too often, just once in a while. Just in the last month or so, though, I couldn't control myself anymore. I really admired those supermen. I always went to their movies and bought their comic books. It was my whole life. Nothing else seemed very real or important. Just them. What about your parents? I never knew my father. He left home when I was a baby. It's just me and my mother. She supported me and gave me money, but we didn't have much. I remember being on county relief. My mother figured I bought all this stuff or traded it with other kids, I guess, like a hobby. You never heard from your father? No, he left after I was born. And how old were you? A year, but I guess he didn't like me very much. It was awful as a kid being the only one in class without a father. Maybe if I'd been tall and strong and good athlete, that wouldn't have mattered so much. But I was always fatso and butterball to the other kids. They'd beat me up and throw my books in the garbage can. It wasn't the pain I couldn't bear. Even when they punched me in the stomach, it wasn't the pain that made me cry. What made me cry is that I hadn't done anything to anyone, and yet everyone hated me. Why should anyone hate a kid just because he's fat? I mean, being a fat kid is bad enough without having people hate you for it. It was only in the movies that I could stop being me. When Super Flame or Commander Jupiter captured a gang of outlaws single-handed, that was me up there on the screen doing it. I'd go to the movies every Saturday and Sunday afternoon. I used to take the bus into Hollywood because that's where most of the theaters were. I used to hate those buses. It wasn't so bad going, but coming home, they were dark and cold and lonely. I was someone special when I was watching the movie, but coming home, I was just fatso Stover again. Didn't you ever have any friends? The only real friends I ever had were Captain Lightning, Wizard Boy, and Super Flame. Where'd you get that outfit you're wearing? I made it myself. Sewed it all myself. Made part of it out of some of my mother's old dresses. These are hers, too. I always hoped that someday I could have enough money to have a real good uniform made up. I used candles. I couldn't afford a flashlight. What'd you use this for? It's my climbing rope. I made it out of one of my mother's black dresses. And this grappling hook? That was for climbing, too, but I never got around to using them. Out at the studio, I used a ladder, and after I got the pictures, I climbed back down and put the ladder back where I found them. How'd you get into the Continental Studios? Over on the Sun Glen side, bordering the studio. There's a hole in the fence. All right, Stanley, what about all the rest of the stuff you stole? Where is it? In my room, out of my house. Do we have to go there? With or without a warrant? You won't need a warrant. I want to give back all the things I stole. But I want you to know one thing. What's that? Captain Lightning, Wizard Boy, Super Flame, and all the others. I only stole their pictures. I never stole their name. I want you to know that. I made up the name of Crimson Crusader. I didn't steal it. There really is no Crimson Crusader. That's right, Stanley. Six thirty-five p.m. We drove the suspect to his home at twenty-one eighty-five Justine Avenue to pick up the stolen articles, the pictures and posters he had taken over the years. And you stole all this, did you? It's not really so much when you think about it. How do you mean? Would your entire life fit into one small room? My mother. She's coming home from work. Do you have to tell her? Stanley, dear, are you home? Oh, God, how I wish I were Captain Lightning. Anytime he wanted to, he could make himself invisible. <laughs> <laughs>
story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On May 10th, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial.
wait right here outside the office. If you need me, why, you just holler. Oh, I couldn't do a thing like that to you. Why not? It was your idea. Captain Joe would like to talk to you if you got a minute. Come on in the office, both of you. What makes you think you can dig him out when IED can't? Huh? You've been talking to internal affairs, haven't you? Yes, sir. You piled up a lot of the crude days, haven't you? Yes, sir. So is every man in the division. How much you got coming? Forty-six days. I asked you before, Gannon. Yes, sir. Internal affairs can't find him. What makes you think you can? Well, we'd like to give it a try. And you'd like four or five days to run it down? Yes, sir. That ought to do it. Two ought to do it. That's all I can give you right now. You know how tight things are. Two will be fine. Don't waste them. No, sir. Uh, just one more thing. Yes, sir? I want you to know I had the same idea. Sergeant William Riddle, the police department counselor. Riddle is the department chaplain as well. Carl Maxwell was an ex-service man. And like a lot of us, we took our troubles to the army chaplain. Maybe Maxwell talked some of his over with Chaplain Riddle. Sorry, Bill. Maxwell never came to me with any of his problems. You think it was the harder thing that did it to him? I'm only guessing, but I've seen these things before. I think having that case thrown out of court was the final straw. But this blow-up appears to me like it's been brewing for some time. How do you mean, Bill? You've seen it happen before. How many officers do you know about that have gone into traumatic shock after having been wounded in the line of duty? This wasn't Maxwell's problem, of course, but there's a similarity. His wound is of a deeper nature, a mental laceration, you might call it. Something like we knew in the service. Call it combat fatigue. Yeah, it could be. Just as surely as some of the men who get shot on the job and fall apart due to shock, others break down due to the pressures of the job. Some of the men who are wounded never recover and have to be relieved of duty. Some who suffer what we call combat fatigue are no different. I see. Now, please understand, I'm not implying for a minute that Carl Maxwell should be or will be relieved of duty. But one thing's certain. If he's taken to the bottle, his life expectancy as a working detective in this department is relatively short. You'll have a hearing before a trial board and be dismissed. That's generally the way these things go down, isn't it? Yeah. We just had a thread to pick up, some place to begin. You figure internal affairs has covered all the obvious places? No question there. Sometimes I think those guys are better investigators than we are. <laughs> I won't comment on that. I used to work there. I'm prejudiced in their favor. But let me give you a thought. Anything's more than we got now. Maybe you're too close to it. How do you mean, Bill? You're looking for a friend, not a suspect. Try approaching it the same way you would any other case, even if internal affairs has been there. Yeah. Start at the beginning. p.m., we decided to take Bill Riddle's advice. We would start from scratch. Since we were on off-duty time, we checked my car out of the police personnel parking area. Los Angeles is a big place to lose yourself in. Undoubtedly, that's what Carl Maxwell had in mind. We knew Maxwell lived in an apartment building. We drove over and talked with his landlady. She told us the same story she had told Internal Affairs Division. She hadn't seen Maxwell in three days, and she had no idea where he might have gone. 1 a.m. For the next eight hours, Bill and I covered every bar, restaurant, and bowling alley within a 10-mile radius of where Maxwell lived. We batted zero. Nobody had seen or heard from him for at least three days. 2.18 a.m. Before we called it a night, we decided to stop and see Champ Ridgely. Ridgely is an ex-light heavy we used to follow when he fought at the Olympic Auditorium. Maxwell and he used to box in the Golden Gloves before Ridgely turned pro. They were good friends. Hi, Sarge. Hi, Gannon. Champ. How's it going, Champ? Ain't seen you fellas for a while. How about some donuts and coffee? No, no donuts. Too fattening. Just coffee, Champ. Anything you say, Gannon. Sugar and cream? No, no thanks. No, sir. Never use it. Too fattening. Gannon, I got a new kind since I saw you last. Chocolate arms with marshmallow, toasted almonds, and peanuts on top. Well, I guess I'll try one after all. Give it a little shot of whipped cream, too, if you like, Bill. No. no. Well, all right. Sure you like it, Gannon? Been selling like hotcakes. Business been good, huh, champ? Can't complain. It ain't like...
like when I was going 10 frames every Friday night, but I ain't bleeding as much neither. Tell me, you see Carl Maxwell lately? Not for a week or so. Something bugging him, Sarge? What makes you say that? Well, it's like he's been, you know, kind of down. He ain't in any trouble, is he? No, no trouble. I hope not. He's a good guy. How's your girlfriend? What's her name, Flora? Oh, that time. Picked her up again. What was it this time, shoplifting? I told her a thousand times. I said, Flora, you gotta stop. Now, how does it look to the neighbors? Cops coming around all the time looking for the hot stuff. They don't even go to the hawk shops anymore. They come here first. Who picked her up this time, Morelli? Yeah. He spends more time with her than he does with his wife. Do you know what he found out of this time, Bill? You know what? A pair of water skis. When did she learn to ski? What ski? She don't even know what they're for. When she brought home a lawnmower. Well, what was she going to do with a lawnmower? I didn't ask. I was afraid she might steal a lawn. You finished? Yeah. That was great, champ. You'll sell a lot of those. You ought to try one, Joe. Nice and light. No, thanks. Real taste sensation. I'm sure. We got to be going, champ. Yeah, I'll see you, champ. Thanks. Sarge, do me a favor, will you? I'll try. Stop in and say hello to Flora. It'll cheer her up. I sure will. The next time I'm by the county jail. Thanks a lot, Sarge. If she hasn't stolen it. February the 15th, 7.30 a.m. I picked Bill up early the next morning and we headed for the Ventura Freeway. Like a great many officers, Carl Maxwell came from a police family. We drove over to see his brother, Al, a sergeant working uniform out of Van Nuys Division. He lived in Reseda. We knew Internal Affairs would have already checked with Al, but we figured it wouldn't do any harm to talk to him again. Well, what brings you two out here so early in the morning? We'd like to talk to you, Al. Good morning, Sergeant Friday, Mr. Gannon. Hi, Hello, boys. Okay, gang, time for school. Hey, don't forget your lunches. Oh, yeah. Nice kids. Mary and I make you. If you change your mind, Eileen will be glad to take them off your hands. You just try telling that to Mary. Yeah. You call me, Sergeant? Good morning, Joe. Bill? Good morning, Mary. You just a time for breakfast? No, thanks, Mary. We've already eaten. Well, sit down, please. Thank you. Al, we were hoping you'd have some idea where Carl might have gone. I told IAD everything I know, Joe. Didn't help him much. How about you, Mary? I wasn't home when they came by, but I'm afraid I can't help much either. Carl's in a lot of trouble, isn't he? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Unless he appears for that trial board, he could be dismissed. Poor Carl. You working this on your own time? Sort of. Nice of you guys. We've worked with Carl a lot of years, Al. You know him better than anybody, Al. What suddenly got to him? Oh, I don't think it was sudden, Bill. I've been worried about him quite a while. How's that? Oh, he hasn't been the same guy. Didn't laugh as much. Wouldn't talk. Couldn't seem to think of anything but his job. I can't remember when he took his last day off. You ever try to get him to see the department counselor? Yeah, but he brushed it off. Said he was in great shape, that I was imagining things. How long has this been going on? Ever since Ellen died. For two years now, Carl's been walking around as though part of him is missing. That's why he works so hard. To fill up that empty space his wife left. So he won't have time to think. Yeah. He's put all his emotions into the job. That's why things hit him so hard. If he gets kicked off the department, he'll really have nothing left. Yeah, I guess. You sure he didn't say anything about where he was going? Nothing, Bill. No, I've been racking my brain. Wait a minute. I don't know if it means anything. Go on, Mary. When he was here last week, you were on night watch, Al. He talked about the happiest time of his life. Said he supposed he ought to be grateful for at least that much happiness. Yeah. On his honeymoon. He say where? Someplace up near Big Bear, wasn't it, Mary? A Swiss place. No, a place that looked Swiss. Kind of a chalet-type hotel. Worth a try. Wish I could go with you, but I've got night watch the rest of the month. I think we can handle it, Al. If we can find him, that is. Are you a policeman? That's right, son. It's Carl's son, Matt. He's been staying with us until Ellen passed away. My daddy's a policeman. I know. We're friends of his. He's not here. He went away. Well, we're going to find him for you. I better come with you. I'm afraid not. Not this time, Matt. What if you can't find him yourself? never clean and simple, is it? No. There's always an innocent bystander. One thirty-seven p.m. Bill and I 
I drove out the San Bernardino Freeway and headed east for the 100-mile trip up to Big Bear Mountain Resort. Big Bear is 6,750 feet up in the San Bernardino Mountains. It's about a two-hour drive from the city. 3.43 p.m., we drove into Big Bear. It had been snowing, but the sun was out, and it was a fairly warm day. We started looking for chalet-type hotels. 4.26 p.m., the third place we hit was called the Summit Lodge. It turned out to be the jackpot. Territory, aren't you? A little. You came up to look at the scenery? No. We came up here to look for you. How about a drink? No, thanks. Have a drink, Friday? Not now, Carl. Oh, on duty and all that jazz, huh? Come on, Carl. It's been a long drive. Talk to us. Yeah, well, that's a long story. Let's just say I've had it. That wasn't worth the trip. It's the best I can do. No, it isn't, Carl. We want to know why. Why you're throwing 12 years of good police work right out the window. Where do you want me to start, Joe? It takes quite a while to cover 12 years. We've got the time. 12 long years, tried and true. Yeah, well, they're a total waste. How's that for openers? You don't really mean that, Carl. Don't I? You tell me who cares about all that good police work. We do. Mary cares. Your brother, Al. And Matt. Sure, let's talk about Matt. You know how much money I could have made in any other job in 12 years? Enough to send him to a good school by the time he was ready. Maybe set him up in business. Or don't I owe him anything? A lot more than you're giving him doing this. He's your son. You owe him a father. A sober one. Neither of you understand what I'm talking about, do you? Oh, yeah. I read you real good. But all I can hear is a loud cry of self-pity. Is it self-pity breaking your back trying to do a job that nobody seems to want you to do? You had a case thrown out of court. You've had it happen before. We all have. Doesn't seem to be enough to be a cop anymore. You've got to be a Philadelphia lawyer, a diplomat, a, a psychologist, an expert on social behavior. That's part of the job, Carl. Always has been. You tell me about it, Cannon. When I first signed on for this job, I was given to understand that my primary function was to enforce the laws. Not make them, not question them, but to enforce them. Sure, I know a certain amount of diplomacy is required, along with tolerance and understanding. The old hat squads are gone, along with the hot lights in the back room, the, the blue-jacketed bullies who used to slug a confession out of a man or a thing of the past. Look, when police work became a profession instead of a male fist, I knew I wanted to be part of it. I believe in equality and fair play, the right to dissent in an open society, the right of privacy, all the inalienable rights guaranteed under the Constitution. Well, it seems to me the pendulum has swung too far the other way. Nobody ever told you that badge was a ticket to paradise. No, Joe, nobody ever told me that. But they did tell me that people make the laws we don't. And that they pay us to enforce them. Well, it seems like somehow nobody really wants you to do the job too good. Look, you pick up a suspect. If you don't treat him like a VIP, he'll be out on the street screaming police brutality. He can confess to rape, murder, child molesting, arson, or assault. But unless you've given him a five-minute speech that tells him not to talk to you, you're the one who's in trouble. You take away a policeman's right to interrogate. You cut off his hands. A while back, the President of the United States came to the city. He couldn't even walk in the front door of a hotel to make a speech. He had to use the rear entrance because 10,000 people were guilty of poor deportment. They refused to share with him the self-same constitutional rights they were claiming for themselves, the right of free access. To come and go as you please. The right of free speech. And those are the same people who pay our salaries. The same people who cry foul when we try and enforce their laws. Look, there are 5,200 of us in the city of 3 million. We're a minority group, too. You tell me, Joe. Is it worth it? Depends on what you want, Carl. If you're looking for applause, no. You should have been an actor. If it's money you're after, truck drivers make more. 
If you expect 100% gratitude for doing a job that's got to be done and somebody goofed 12 years ago when they let you get by. You're right, Carl. We are a minority group, but not by an act of God or an accident. The only way you become a member of this minority group is by asking for it. And only about 4% make it, you know that. Maybe you've forgotten what you went through to join. The physical endurance tests, the psychological evaluations. Are you suited to be a police officer? Can you be objective? Will your emotions affect your job? Can you take orders? Can you give them? Does carrying a gun and a badge give you a feeling of power? Now, if you don't measure up properly to all those qualifications, you don't get into this minority, Carl. Only the best men do. The cream. And what about those three solid months hitting the books going to school? Have you forgotten your probationary period? Where you really started learning to become a policeman? Nine long months to make sure you did learn, because if you didn't, you could still be eliminated. And after all that, if you were still in the handful that lasted, then, Carl, you could say I'm a cop. You earned your way into this minority group. And now you're frustrated. Well, pal, join the club. Gripe about it, that's your privilege. But while you're sitting there on your bottom sucking on a drink, try to remember why you signed on in the first place. It's a fine profession. Four professionals. And there aren't enough to go around. When does the trial board convene? Monday morning. What do you think, Joe? Will they bounce me out? Maybe not. If you can convince them. Of what? That you deserve to be a policeman, and you still want to be one. If I can't? You don't belong on the job. Police Department heard the case of Sergeant Carl Maxwell. In a moment, the results of that hearing. The board found Sergeant Carl Maxwell guilty of conduct unbecoming an officer and of having been absent from his post. We checked in with the acting commander of Sunset Division. An accusation had come from a man in custody at the division. His name was John Meadows. His charge against the arresting officer, police brutality. You men from IAD? Yes, sir. Bill Gannon, Joe Friday. The captain's off sick. I'm acting commander. How do you want to handle this? Some place we could use for an interview room. My office be all right? Yes, sir. Fine. Do you have the complainant statement, Lieutenant? Being typed up now. Have you had a chance to check Hillier's personnel file? Only briefly, sir. Brought it along with us. Let me save you some reading time. Ed Hillier's been assigned here since he graduated from the academy. Personnel rating reports put him in the top 10%. I just put through a commendation that should earn him the Medal of Valor. Served in Vietnam. Wounded. Decorated. Military service record reads as good as the one he's piled up here. College man. Two years. Happily married. Sounds like you've been keeping an eye on him, Lieutenant. How do you mean that? Well, you seem to have made a special study of this Hillier. No more than the other 200 men at this station. I make it my business to know about him. That's what's gnawing at me inside. Yes, sir. In my book, Ed Hillier adds up to an intelligent, dedicated policeman. Now, if the charge against him is true, the question is this. Did Hillier fail us, or did we fail him? Is there something I'm not giving my people at roll call? Is it the training program? Or did we simply misjudge this man when we said he was good enough to wear a badge? Well, that's part of what we're here to find out, sir. While you're at it, maybe you can find this out. Is it possible the department expects too much of these young officers? How do you mean, sir? How long has it been since either one of you been on the street? It's been a while. I don't get out there much either, nailed to this desk. But I hear it and see it every day. 
the name calling, the verbal abuse. Today's policeman has become the symbol of the so-called establishment, the visual target for practically every gripe society has these days. I don't mean to sound like a bleeding heart, but it's true, isn't it? Seems to be, yes, sir. I'm sorry. I'll climb down off my box now. I didn't mean to put you to for all that. We understand, sir. You'll want to talk to Reed Malloy, the backup team. Yes, sir, we will. I told them to wait before they go off watch. Yes, sir, that'll be fine. I'd hate to lose Hillier. He's a good man. Yes, sir. But if he's turned sour, he's no good to the department. a.m. Bill picked up the complainant statement and the arrest report. I examined Officer Ed Hillier's personnel record. We asked the jailer to bring the complainant, John Meadows, to the office. All right, you want to sit down there? Okay. This is Sergeant Friday. My name's Gannon. We're from Internal Affairs Division. What's that? Well, among other things, Internal Affairs investigates complaints against police officers, and you filed a complaint. It's a pretty good deal, isn't it? No. How's that, sir? Policeman investigating policemen? Let me explain it to you. We're here because the chief of police cares about your complaint. So does the police commission. When we've completed our investigation here, the chief or a board of the accused policeman's superior officers will weigh the evidence and make a decision. Now, Officer Hillier, the man you've accused, could be reprimanded, suspended for up to six months without pay, or fired. Or he could be cleared of the charges. But it's still a policeman passing judgment on a policeman. Regardless of what decision the department makes, you're still entitled to file whatever legal action you might care to bring against the arresting officer. Is that clear? I see. Now, as far as policemen passing judgment on policemen, wouldn't it be a good idea to wait and see the outcome before you make up your mind it's one-sided? Maybe. We'll see. All right, sir. State your true name. John Everett Meadows, Jr. Your address, please. 221 Garland Street. You ever been arrested before? Yeah, four times. You want to give us the circumstances? 1951, back in Omaha, Nebraska. I was 12 years old. I liked ball games. Had a big thing for the left field fence. The management couldn't see it. All right, Mr. Meadows. Will you tell us what happened at 221 Garland Street at approximately 1.47 a.m. this morning, October 10? I told it all once to that sergeant. We'd like to hear it again, if you would, please. All right, but first I want to make one thing abundantly clear. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I'm no kook. I work for a living. I don't burn draft cards, picket politicians, or smoke pot. I pay my bills, and I pay my taxes. I just want to get the record straight, understood? Perfectly. That makes four of us. Yeah? Who's the fourth? Officer Hillier. More power to him. Okay. It's on the record. Now, you want to tell us exactly what happened? Well, there wasn't much to it, really. Not to start with, anyhow. We were having a few drinks. Six of us. Three couples. We'd work late at the store. Cliveden's over on Wilshire. I'm a buyer there. Men's furnishings. They were the people I work with. You've got their names and addresses. Good people, all of them. You say you were drinking? Well, yeah. Not heavy, just to unwind. Go on, Meadows. Well, I guess we got a little noisy. The old gal next door called the cops. She told you she called? Yeah, so we broke it up. Well, started to, anyway. Well, how do you mean? Well, the first couple left, Ted Nichols and his fiance. Their names are on your list. Nichols, wasn't he the 502? 502? Drunk. Hillier said he was drunk. That's his opinion. In my opinion, he was a long way from it. All right, what happened then? Ted and his gal got in the car. Just then, Hillier and his partner came around the corner. Ted pulled away from the curb. His foot slipped on the gas pedal, and he banged into a station wagon. It was parked maybe 20 feet in front of him. Hillier was just in time to see it. Go on. Well, we heard the noise and came outside. Hillier was already giving Ted a bad time. In what way? What do you mean? Well, in what way was Officer Hillier giving Nichols a bad time? Oh, you know, bugging him for his license, shaking him down, accusing him of being stoned, the whole stupid bit, and Teddy's not even feeling good. What happened then? I asked this Hillier for his badge number. He told me to read it for myself. Well, I reached for his badge, and he jumped back. And what happened next? Now, this is when I goofed, and I'm the first guy to admit it. Hillier's partner had Teddy in the police car. I knew they were going to take him in, and that really burned me up. I started for him. I guess Hillier thought I was going to try and get him loose. Were you? Come on, Sergeant, be serious. With two cops around and more on the way, I'm going to try and spring a guy from out of a police car? It's happened before. Well, I guess that's what Hillier must have thought. But I hadn't committed murder, you know. So how does Hillier react? Like I just machine gun City Hall, man. I don't mean maybe. He was all over me. And then, wham, down I went. Well, exactly what do you mean by down I went? Exactly what it sounds like. Hillier slugged me. Where did he strike you? Right here, on the jaw. Did you request medical attention? Well, you bet I did. Felt like that cop tore my head off. What did Officer Hillier strike you with? 
His fist. His fist. And you say you went down. That's right, on both knees. Tell me, are those the same trousers you were wearing when you were arrested this morning? That's right. No damage to the material, is there? It was on the parkway. It's all grass. Light-colored material, no grass stains. You two just playing detective with me, or are you doing what I strongly suspect? Trying to whitewash this whole affair. Well, you said it yourself, Mr. Meadows. Oh, yeah? What's that? Just want to get the record straight. the clothing store where John Meadows worked. I spoke to the four witnesses. Get a hold of them? Yeah, they all said they'd be able to give us their statements. What about Hillier? On his way in. Should be here in about an hour. Backup team. Reed and Malloy are waiting for us in the roll call room. Did you talk to him? Only to say hello. Malloy's the senior man. Been on the job seven years. Reed's a probationer. Yeah. I don't know. You take a look at that Reed. Seems to me they're getting younger all the time, Joe. Oh, we're getting older. Sergeant Price. Mr. Pete Malloy. Malloy? My partner, Jim Reed. Reed? Sit down. Reed, I meant to ask you before. Are your dad in the department? No, sir. Wrong Reed. Oh. Sergeant? Yeah. What's going to happen to Ed Hillier? Depends on whether the complaint against him is justified. What happens if it is? He can draw a suspension of up to 30 days without pay from the chief, or he may have to face a trial board. Now, you know what that is? Not too much, no, sir. Good. Try to keep it that way. The trial board is three other ranking officers, captain or above. Board can suspend him for up to six months without pay or fire him. It's kind of rough. So it's a punch in the jaw. Ted Hillier's a good man. Smart, conscientious, works hard, and he likes people. All right. Let's talk about last night. There's not a whole lot to tell. We were the backup unit. If Hillier punched anybody in the jaw, it was before we got there. When you arrived, what was going on? Hillier had Meadows up against his unit. He was shaking him down. His partner, Pollock, had the 502 suspect in the back seat. That was Nichols. Ted Nichols, that's right. What were the other people doing? They were drunk and loud. Any name calling going on? The usual, given all of us a bad time. Hillier's partner, Pollock, got out of the car and asked if we'd make the TA report and take the 502 down to the station. Said they had to drive the other guy to central receiving. Did he say why? He said he'd been hurt resisting arrest. Who said? Hillier. What'd you do then? We cleared the area and went back on patrol. This Nichols, did he appear drunk to you? He was definitely under the influence. He registered .21 on the BA. It was a good arrest, Sergeant. All right, we'll go over all this again when you make your individual statements, but I want you to think carefully about what I'm going to ask you now. Did Hillier seem upset? Did he do anything out of the ordinary? Reed? Not that I noticed. Malloy? He said something. Maybe it's important, maybe it isn't. Everything's important. When I first walked up to him, he turned his head toward me and kind of whispered. What did he say? I'm sick, he said. I'm so sick I could vomit. that has to do with Johnny Meadows, is that it? Yes, sir. We'd like you to tell us what happened over on Garland this morning. you got to believe I was out of it most of the time. At least from 9 o'clock on, that's when we started hitting the juice. Just tell us what you remember. Beginning when? At the beginning, as best you can recall. Well, we were in Johnny's apartment. The stereo was going full blast. Everybody was laughing at Patsy. She's a real kick, you know? She does a great imitation of an opera singer. A real talented girl, Patsy is. Yes, sir. Go on, please. Uh, well, there's a knock on the apartment door. Johnny opened it. I saw this heavy set lady. She said she'd had it with all the noise, and the cops were on the way. That was all I had to hear. As soon as the woman left, I grabbed Alice by the arm and took off. We ran outside and jumped in the car. I couldn't get it started, though. I was nervous, I guess. Just as it did fire up, I looked in the rearview mirror, and a police car was pulling in behind us. 
Well, now, why were you nervous, Mr. Nichols? Simple. I'm scared to death of cops. Don't ask me why. I just am. You ever been arrested before? No, sir. I was raised to believe anybody that had ever been arrested was a bum. I'm no bum. A drunken bum, maybe, but not an ordinary bum. What happened after you saw the police car pulling in behind you? I was looking in the rearview mirror at that black and white car, and I stepped on the gas. There was a crash, and the next thing I knew, somebody's helping me out of the car. Would you go on, please? I've gone on just about as far as I can go on. I remember looking at a policeman. I remember walking in the police station. I remember blowing into some kind of gadget. Oh, I remember being here right now. That's it. Do you recall any kind of altercation? What do you mean? Anybody hit anybody. Oh, sure wouldn't have been me. I couldn't find the sidewalk. Somebody hit somebody? Who says one of the cops claimed Johnny hit him? The other way around. Johnny says he got slugged by one of the cops? That's what he says. I don't know about you, but I believe him. Is that right? I've known Johnny Meadows for over ten years, and I've never known him to lie about anything. <laughs> Officer Edward W. Hillier reported in for his interview. He told us substantially the same story that we had gotten from his partner and from the backup team, Officers Reed and Malloy. Hillier had been removed from field duty and placed on station duty pending the outcome of the IAD investigation. We asked the suspect and his passenger to get out of the vehicle. They complied. My partner started to interrogate the woman passenger. I asked the suspect for his driver's license. His name was Ted Nichols. We didn't try to give him the field sobriety exam. He was so drunk we were afraid he might fall down and hurt himself. At this point, I heard loud voices and I observed four people, two men and two women, approaching from the duplex at 221 Garland. The person doing all the talking was a man named John Meadows, who we later booked for interfering due to the fact that he grabbed my partner's arm and tried to prevent him from placing the 502 suspect in our unit. You say Meadows was doing all the talking. Exactly what did he say? Well, the usual things, you know. Tell us. He called us the Gestapo, Fuzz, Stormtroopers... The usual things you hear. Said we had no right to shove his friend around, that he, Nichols, didn't do any damage to the Ford wagon. Was there any damage? Yes, sir. The rear bumper guards were sheared off and the left rear taillight was smashed. All right, Hillier, go on. Well, this Meadows asked me for my badge number. I put my thumb behind the shield and turned my light on. He reached out to grab the badge. I told him not to touch it, but to take down the number if that's what he wanted. He made a grab for it. He got the fingers of his right hand around the badge. I twisted away to my left, breaking his hold. I heard my shirt rip. That's when he said it. Said what? Called me a pig cop. Said all cops were filthy pigs and their wives were sow belly pigs. Those were his exact words? Yes, sir, his exact words. Sergeant, before I put that uniform on, nobody ever called me a pig before. Nobody. My wife either. And I'm tired of hearing it. What happened then? I told him I was taking him in for interfering with an arrest. He said, try it, pig. And that's when it happened. When what happened? I backhanded him. Show us how. I'm like this, with the back of my right hand. Where'd you hit him? Across the right cheek, lower portion of his right jaw. Did you cut him? No, sir, I didn't. He said he was hurt, so we drove him over to Central Receiving. You can check his MT slip. No visible injury. All right, Hillier. Anything else you want to add? What else is there to say? I'm cooked, and I know it. Let me ask you something, Hillier. Yes, sir. Why do you think you struck that man? You're a good policeman. Outstanding record on the job. And you know better, don't you? I guess. You guess or you know? Well, I'll tell you what I know, Sergeant. Lately, I've taken everything from verbal abuse and threats to being hospitalized by a guy with a DTs. In the last eight months, I've had two windshields busted out of my unit. First time, it was a 30 odd 6 slug. Guy who fired it just didn't like cops. Second time, it was a brick. Kid who threw it had to take time out from what he was doing. Burning the American flag. I've lost count of how many dents we've had to roll out of the unit. Rocks, bottles, chunks of lumber, you name it, they throw it. The people we're hired to protect and serve. You guys tell me. I can't pull up an answer. Would you say that this Meadows could have been the last straw, maybe? Is that it? Maybe. When that guy was clawing at my badge and screeching at me, all I could seem to see with the face is the angry mouths of everybody I've come in contact with the last few months. I guess that's who I was backhanding. Every one of them. Not just Meadows. Hell, your, your personal history card lists a whole string of commendations from those angry citizens you have to serve. But if it didn't list one, so what? You pick up your check, don't you? You get paid to be a policeman, not to be loved. You don't buy that 100%, do you, Sergeant? No. I'd like a kind word now and again. 
When they don't come, I write it off as part of the job. When you first put that uniform on, nobody ever told you you'd be running in a popularity contest, not did they? No, sir, they didn't. Your PRR puts you in the top 10% of the department. Now, to me, that indicates a trained, capable, disciplined police officer, not a back alley brawler. You were riding with a young partner. What kind of an example do you think you set for him? And worse, you committed one of the cardinal sins in our business. You struck a man. And I'll use your words. A man you're hired to protect and to serve. Now, one last thing, Hillier, and maybe this is the most pregnant issue of all. These are tenuous times we live in. The young people in this country are groping, searching for a direction, and they're having trouble finding it. The older people in our society are not much better off. They seem to have lost or misplaced one of our great American commodities, a true sense of the real values, the values that built this country into the great one that it is. I tell you, I never thought I'd live to see the day that it becomes stylish to shout down constituted law and justice, to scream police brutality at almost every opportunity. There's the key to this, Hillier. When you lost control this morning at 2 a.m. out there on Garland Street, you laid another bruise on every man who wears a uniform and a badge. Your newspaper story will give credence to those whose sole aim is to kick authority right in the groin. And you've shaken the confidence of those who believe in order with justice. Now, a lot more went down out there on Garland Street this morning besides a man being struck by a policeman. But is it asking too much, Sergeant? What's that? The people. What about them? Can't they see there are two sides to it? Twelve noon, Officer Ed Hillier's wife asked if she could talk to us. Can I get you a cup of coffee, Mrs. Hillier? No, thank you. I'll make this as brief as possible. I know you men are busy. Take your time. We're not that busy. Thank you. I'm scared to death. I really am. There's no need to be, Mrs. Hillier. I feel that Ed's whole future is at stake. Please don't let him be fired, please. Well, it isn't up to us, but he'll be given a fair hearing. I brought this. I thought it might help prove Ed's story. He thinks it's a blouse I'm taking back to the store. Open it, please. That's why I wanted to talk to you. Ed said he didn't think it would make that much difference, but I hope it will. Ed's shirt? Yes, the one he wore last night. You can see it's torn there where he wears his badge. Yes, ma'am. Well, that proves he's telling the truth, doesn't it? We're not questioning his truthfulness, Mrs. Hillier. Ed's a good policeman, Sergeant. Yes, ma'am. He's never made a mistake before. This was a big one. He mustn't lose his job. It's his life, his whole life. That's all there is to it. first of the four witnesses who were in Meadows' apartment the night of the incident. Look, there's no question about it. That cop cuffed Johnny. What do you mean, cuffed him? Like this it was with the back of his hand right across the face. He gave him a good whack. Was there any provocation for Officer Hillier striking Meadows? How do you mean? Was there any name calling? Not a word. That cop just hit him for no reason. The next witness was a clerk at the store. Her name was Patsy Cronin. Oh, I should say so. They always seem to get a kick out of my opera store impersonations. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do you say you heard some name calling? I sure did. Johnny Meadows is a pain when he gets tanked. Call that policeman a pig. His wife, too. Want to know what I think? Yes, ma'am. What do you think? I don't blame that officer. I'd have knocked Johnny's head off. The third witness was Mary Kay Morton. She worked as a secretary in the store. I guess the reason the cop hit him was because Johnny grabbed for his badge. Did you see anything else, Miss Morton? No, but I heard something. What did you hear? The sound of fabric being ripped, you know, torn. Have you any idea where that sound came from? I know where it came from. Yes, ma'am. When that bonehead Johnny grabbed the policeman's badge, he tore his shirt. fourth and final witness was Alice Jenkins, the girlfriend of the 502 suspect, Ted Nichols. Teddy told me he's sorry about that man's station wagon, but he's going to pay for the damage. All right, now, have you told us everything you can remember about this morning? Yes, everything. I'll tell you how this entire mess looks to me. All right, Miss Jenkins, go ahead. No matter what anybody calls a cop, he's no right to hit anybody. <laughs> We concluded our investigation of the incident involving Officer Edward Hillier. 
Tomorrow morning, we would reduce it all down to paper and submit the reports to the captain for processing. How's it look, Friday? Well, my guess is that he'll be set down. How hard, I don't know, Lieutenant. What's the bottom line? As far as answers go, the kind you're looking for, I'm afraid we didn't come up with many. I suppose not. You know, we had a pretty good chief that you served under, and so did we. Bill Parker. Maybe he said it best. We'll always have incidents like this because we have one big problem in selecting police officers. What's that? We have to recruit from the human race. just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 20th, John Meadows pleaded guilty in Municipal Court, City of Los Angeles, to the charges of interfering with a police officer and resisting arrest, both misdemeanor offenses. On that same day, the chief of police of the City of Los Angeles made a decision in the matter of Officer Edward Hillier. In a moment, the results. John Meadows was given a 30-day sentence in the Los Angeles County Jail. Since it was his first offense, the sentence was suspended. The accused police officer, 